Oh, hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Mr. Warren Hayes Show. I, of course, am Mr. Warren Hayes. We're going to be talking about pro wrestling here for a couple of hours, if you don't mind, if that's all right with you. That's what we are going to be doing here, uh, recording uh, on uh, January 24th. We did this live, as we usually do on YouTube.com slash Mr. Warren Hayes, and you're watching the On Demand right now, the video On Demand, a little edited down, a little taken out a bit, of trimmed the fat down a little bit to give you something a little little more concise, a little more, not, not a stream of consciousness that I can do. Uh, when I'm doing it live, but uh, look, if you can ever make it live, we record every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, and it's a lot of fun. We've got a good little group going. So it's it's fun. It's fun. Fun times are fun, but look, you're listening on demand right now, and that's really cool, and I appreciate it. Uh, consider giving a like on the video, a thumbs up, and subscribing if this is the first time you're here, too. Uh, that would be really appreciate it. It helps grow the podcast, and you can also help grow the podcast on your favorite podcast application as well, because yes, the audio is out there, on your favorite podcast app, for real, it's there, and leaving a five-star review and a five-star uh, rating, either on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, that stuff helps out a great deal. All, any type of love you can show, that helps out a great deal, uh, and it helps grow the podcast, such as it helps grow um, the AEW Dynamite review, which I do every Thursday, on the day after the previous night's Dynamite, where I go through everything that happened on the show, uh, so be sure to check that out as well. And um, yeah, uh, the, oh, Mr. Warren Hayes Show Discord. If you like to talk about pro wrestling with other pro wrestling aficionados, that's the place. Come right in. Uh, the link is in the description. We'd love to have you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you appreciate everything that's uh, going to go down for the next couple of hours. Of course, we're going to be talking about uh, Nick Khan, the interview that he gave recently to, to Bill Simmons. There's a bit of stuff to unpack there. Giving, gonna go right into the My Royal Rumble preview as well. That's the big uh, WWE PLE happening this weekend. And lots of stuff happening in Japanese wrestling. Spurred off of the New Japan Noah show. Oh, if you're if you're a Puro fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and hopefully you're excited as I am. Kaiji Muto's final matches. Let's just get right to it. Thank you for being here, and uh, hope you enjoy the show. We are going to start with the weekly wrestling inspection. Um, some uh, there's some good news to kick things off. Um, to uh, to kick things off uh, today, um, and um, it's been it's been sort of coming together over the past um, 24 hours, really. Uh, but it all sort of came to head today, where it was announced that Mark Briscoe is going to make an AW Dynamite debut. Uh, tomorrow on uh, on Dynamite. Of course, we record this on on a Tuesday, January twenty fourth. Uh, <coughs> so we're we're a day before. By the time there's a good chance you you're, you're hearing this, and you know it's already old news. But Mark Briscoe is going to make uh, his AEW Dynamite debut uh, in a Jay Briscoe tribute match against uh, Jay Lethal a week after the death of his brother uh, unexpectedly uh, of his brother's unexpected death in a car accident mark briscoe will be debuting uh in lexington kentucky he'll be taking on an old time old school ring of honor rival jay lethal to honor the late jay briscoe on what would have been jay briscoe's 39th birthday and as it stands right now uh the observer uh underscores this uh the briscoes are still recognized as ring of honor tag team champions they have not been Stripped. According to Dave Meltzer, Mark is now allowed on AEW television going forward. And that AEW has also cleared to honor Jay on the show as well. Both Briscoes had been banned from AEW TV due to past homophobic tweets. At least that's what we, that is the most uh, uh, commonplace uh, excuse. Uh, tweets that had been done by Jay that he later not only apologized for, but made amends with and uh, really went down a path to to change and improve. The two were under Ring of Honor contracts and they uh, on AEW television, of course, they could only appear in graphics uh, and never really like on video or live. And it, just as yesterday, 
you know, it was still being reported that Mark was not allowed on AEW TV. Then the very next day, it's like, you know, AEW, uh, the, you know, that Meltzer was reporting that AEW had confirmed that uh, Warner Bros. Discover Bros. had changed its policy uh, on Mark Briscoe and that, the, you know, they could be they could be doing things moving forward. <clears throat> and um, Tony Khan today was on the Battleground podcast and he said that he fought hard in order to get the match approved. Um, he said that both Mark and Jay Lethal, Mark Briscoe and Jay Lethal, requested the match, which would take place. He says, uh, this is a quote from um, from uh, Tony Khan here. He says, it's going to be a great match honoring a great man. These men requested this match. Wednesday will be the 39th birthday of the late great Jay Briscoe and his longtime friend and rival Jay Lethal and his brother Mark Briscoe wanted to honor the legacy of Jay Briscoe and I fought hard to make it happen and I'm really excited about the match. I think it's great that they're going to be able to honor the legacy of somebody that everybody in pro wrestling has so much respect for. This is going to be something really great for everybody in the locker room who is rallying around the Briscoe family because yeah, the um, uh, Jay's girls aren't out of the woods yet. They're improving though. Um, uh, their, 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 their condition is getting better So, and, it, it, and the outlook seems... Um, it doesn't seem as bleak, so that's good. So the uh, so so I think it will be somewhat of a cathartic moment, and I'm glad this uh, this happened. Now we can't. Uh, uh, oh, and 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 also we're getting Ian uh, Riccoboni, we're getting uh, Caprice Coleman, and uh, we're also getting uh, um, Bobby Cruz in on the action too. So it's going to be very much like a. Uh, very much in the Ring of Honor in a, in a Ring of Honor setting. Um, now the, the 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 only problem that I have with it because you know I think we cannot we cannot not um, talk about the you know the stoogery involved by the executives at uh, at Warner Bros who were who somehow had these fucking cold feet around this guy who was beloved by all and. And I, I don't think anyone really realized the scope of how much Jay Briscoe was appreciated by his peers uh, across the business um, uh, until his unfortunate passing. And that in itself is a little tragic, but, you know, maybe a discussion for for another time. But, um, yeah, I mean, look, the, the guy... Uh, the guy years ago, and we're talking about over a decade ago, right? He, you know, did some tweets. There was a bit of a, not necessarily, not necessarily great, uh, especially in hindsight, not looking great at all, but his, he has done everything to try and better himself and understand and get better. And when you see uh, uh, figureheads of the wrestling LGBTQ plus community just coming out and saying, you know what, we're, we support Jay Briscoe, and this was even before uh, he passed on, right? This was, you know, a few, last year, a few months ago, in in, in 2022, where you'd have, uh, where where you'd have these figureheads coming out and and showing their support for for Mark, uh, for Jay, excuse me, and saying that he's done everything to 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 improve and change his ways. Well, I mean, what are we even doing? What are we doing? Uh, listening to these executives going we don't want this guy on television whereas they they will endure so much other trash on their network as opposed to just letting this guy finally get a chance at cracking uh, cracking the mainstream getting a a big time contract right i mean it's ridiculous to me and and, and you know i don't know how much smooth talking tony had to do not privy to those types of conversations. I don't know how uh, how we how we was able to crack that nut, but the I guess the important thing is that we are at this conjecture here and uh, we're able to to move forward. But I still think that it sucks tremendously, one hundred percent. That next that for the the entirety of twenty twenty two. The Briscoes could not benefit from popping on AEW television, 
continue to make a proper living for themselves and, you know, enter the consciousness of a larger base of fans. Because, you know, there, I've, I've heard so many wonderful obituaries from, from hardcore fans. I've read the one in The Observer, just fantastic stuff um, outlining his, his decorated career. There's tons of stuff that I learn about Jay and Mark at the same time. I mean, though, both of them are intertwined as far as their, 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 their career paths go. You know, the, there's an absolute argument to make to to to. Uh, there's an absolute argument to be made that they are one of the greatest tag teams of all time, one of the great all time tag teams. Never slowed down. Have always been on top of the game. Have always adapted to uh, whatever styles of wrestling were at the time. Of course, they don't. They don't do the crazy ass shit that they were that they would do when they were 18 and their bodies hadn't had. Two decades of wear and tear on it, of course, you know. But still, even to this day, coming coming out of 2022 with uh, three, uh, a triumvirate of the greatest tag team matches ever, you know, probably, you know, probably the greatest tag team series of all time. I mean, I'd go as far as to say it is. Their entire body of work that precedes them. Look, I mean, it sucks that because... It sucks because Jay, Jay Briscoe really did do everything that needed to be done to improve, to put that behind him, and not just in a performative sense. You know, not just coming out and saying, you know, I'm going to do better. You know, put pulling out the notes, tweet the, the notes app, and and tweeting out, I'll I'll do better. I'm going to learn from this experience and move forward. No, he went to people. He talked with people. He opened up conversations like, look, I don't understand. Make me understand kind of thing. Help me. Help me understand what I can, what I did wrong here. Because I want to do better. I want to be better. Now we end up with a, you know, we, the, the outcome of this is, you know, a bunch of craven executives over at uh, Discover Bros and uh, who... Don't want him on TV. Don't want anything to do with him. I wouldn't want to deal with this. But as AK Germany 96 in the chat said, using his membership uh, milestone message, 20 months, a member. Thank you so much, AK Germany. I appreciate, I appreciate all those 20 months. He says, Warner Brothers put on slap fight. So, so much for their standards. <coughs> Pardon me. You're not wrong. <laughs> You're not wrong. I think everyone who watched it has pointed this out where you start off with, you know, in the context of everything where you have Dana White in the show saying, you know, sometimes you just want to slap. You get so mad you want to slap someone, right? Everyone has pointed that out in regards to the very real life happenings of what he did to his wife. So stupid. But um, it's some good news. Yeah, you know, I don't, I, we have to point it out because I think it's important that we say cognizant that the executives here drop the ball. Oh, he's passed away. Well, okay. I guess we can do it now. It's craven is what it is. It's cowardly. But it's still good news. It's still something, you know. Everyone who was very upset last week, <clears throat> you know, yes, you know, there is the Ring of Honor show that was, tri tribute show that was taped. There's probably going to be more things. We're going to get a proper send-off uh, on Wednesday night. It's going to be very emotional. It's going to be, uh, you know, wrestling that's going to make you feel shit. Nick Khan did an interview last week. I want to talk about that, but I have to put some context around it too, right? Because there's because there, there's there's Nick Khan doing his interview with Bill Simmons last week. Nick Khan, of course, sole CEO, the this the sole survivor of the of WWE CEO, the CEO challenge. Let's put it into context first. Before, <clears throat> Wall Street Journal reported last week. 
that Vince McMahon agreed to a multi-million dollar legal, uh, excuse me, a multi-million dollar settlement with Rita Chatterton. Chatterton, as you may or may not know, is a former WWF referee that accused Vince of raping her in 1986. According to people familiar with the agreement, the settlement was completed last month, ergo December 2022, to avert public litigation over her allegations. Because as Vince and WWE pursue a, 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 a possible eventual sale of WWE, well, you know, <laughs> this doesn't... It, it, it's not a nice little uh, it's it, it, it's not a nice little thing to carry over into a into a sale now, is it? Earlier, uh, um, Chatterton demanded eleven point seven five million dollars in damages for the alleged rape, but it is said that the uh, that they agreed on an amount less than what she requested, but still in the millions, multiple millions of dollars, according to the Wall Street Journal. Jerry McDevitt, of course, he's always a uh, he's always a, a a persona in these situations. He's McMahon's personal lawyer. He said, "Quote: McMahon denies. Mr. McMahon, excuse me. Mr. McMahon denies and has always denied raping this uh, raping Chatterton, and he settled the case solely to avoid the cost of litigation. Solely to avoid the cost." of litigation sure of course this is bullshit <laughs> Vince can afford taking people to court that's not that's bullshit it wasn't to avoid this it's it, it's bad v Vince Vince and Jeremy Jerry or and Mr. McDevitt McDevitt did I call him? J I called him Jeremy. Did I? I think I called him Jeremy, but it's Jerry McDevitt, and I really had, I really had a brain spasm there. It's Jerry McDevitt. I don't know why, and I wrote down Jeremy. I don't know why I wrote down Jeremy. Prince McDevitt. But um, McDevitt here telling telling us, you know, that oh, it's just because he wanted to uh, to avoid, uh, uh, he, you know, oh, he just wanted to avoid the co the cost of litigation. You know, it's it's really because if because of the sale, because they wanted to move this aside and you know, and not have this hanging over their head. Because as opposed to any of the NDAs that are out there right now that we know exist and the other allegations as well, Chatterton, uh, Chatterton was lawyered up and she was ready to go to court, right? Now, this way, WWE doesn't have to go through a public battle because if this hadn't been settled, it would have probably turned into a legal complaint, had to be filed, and uh, and you know and that's you know that's just it. It's like if it's not settled, and if it goes to court, and the battle becomes very public, you know that means that this this generates more reporting. That means there's more news articles happening in the news because people are following this uh, this stuff in the news. And I think this is you know I think that not only that, not only is, is it bad for the sale, but look, I think this is. Further proof that he's looking for a sale where he remains in power of the company, where he re where he keeps a, a a a position of authority in the sale. I think this is this is clear as day. Because otherwise, because if 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 Chatterton had pushed forward, if this had gone to trial, then Vince becomes clearly a liability, and no one wants to touch him with a ten foot pole. Otherwise, why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he pursue litigation, right? What? Here's the thing. What is he afraid of if he's not pursuing litigation? If he's, you know, if he's never done it, what is he afraid of by going to trial to prove Rita Chatterton wrong? 
Is it because he doesn't have a strong case? That could be. Uh, or is he afraid that it might open up a whole can of worms? That there's things out there about him that he doesn't want on the public record. You know, that we within the, the, the wrestling sphere talk about and know about going, you know, you know, just Jimmy Snuka and, uh, and, and the Ring Boys and uh, Owen Hart and, 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 and the other allegations out there. Like there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of muck around Vince and this is just the shit we know. So imagine the stuff that we don't know. But even besides what we don't know, the things that we do know that could easily end up in reports, in new, you know, in major newspapers, not the dirt sheets, but major reports, CNN, more Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the LA Times, the New York Times. You get the picture. Then Vince becomes completely exposed at this point. And if there's one thing that Vince loves more than power, hang on a second, let me think of that. No, here's the thing. The, the one thing that Vince McMahon loves less than power, but more than WWE, is his public image. His legacy. He, this is, there are things for which he wants to be remembered on. And he wants, he wants the general populace to, to, do the, to do the bowing thing when, you know, no chance in hell starts playing. That's what he wants to do. So I think this is pretty transparent, actually. You know, you can buy into the lawyer saying, oh, we just don't want the cost associated with this. But if, you know, Rita was ready to go, but the, she's probably getting what she wants and good for her. Good for her. And if it can help bring some type of, 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 of vindication of, you know, I don't know how, you, is, do you ever really have closure on, in a sexual assault situation, a rape um, uh, you know, uh, situation. I don't know. You know, I, I, I would say it's difficult. Does money fix that? You know, other than just wanting to stick it to the, the, the son of a bitch who did that to you. I mean, good for her. But in regards to, in regards to Vince, we, we, we let's not be naive here. The question was not, the question was absolutely not whether Vince was going to, uh, whether Vince is doing this to save money or not. He's not doing this to save money in any way, shape or form. So this is the context that get, in which we, we go into the Nick Khan interview, right? Uh, Nick Khan, who, uh, who was on the Bill Simmons podcast last week. I wouldn't say this was a bad interview. I, li I listened to the whole thing. And, uh, you know, and I went in there a little hesitant uh, because it was, you know, I, I understand that Bill Simmons is a, you know, he's a f former sports journalist and, uh, and he, uh, he was fired from ESPN, if I'm not mistaken. I don't, you know, one of the big two, either ES ESPN or Fox, because he was taking it to the NFL. You know, he, you know, he, and, uh, and the network was like, well, look, we, you gotta, you, you gotta slow down on the NFL, brother. There are partners. And it was like, no way, brother. I'm not slowing down. I was like, oh, okay. Well, you're, you're going to have to hit the bricks then. Okay. But he's also, uh, friends with Nick Khan, probably even uh, Khan probably even represented him when he was a sports agent. So, um, I was like, oh, well, maybe this is going to be a big old love fest, but no, no. Like he asked him some some pretty decent questions uh you know clearly he's not a he's not a, a he's not in the wrestling bubble so there's a lot of you know questions that maybe you and I would have asked <laughs> Nick Khan in this circumstance but uh you know uh I thought this was a pretty decent interview and my main takeaway here is I find that Nick Khan lost a lot of credibility but Instead of explaining it in one lump sum, let me walk you through my thought process here. Uh, no, he's, nope, that, absolutely, he is absolutely not uh, Ariel Helwani starstruck by Triple H. Anyway, 
No one asked. Bill Simmons did not ask anyone about uh, their training regimen. Let's put it that way. Uh, in this interview, um, uh, Nick Khan, and I'm not going to go through the entire interview, but things that stood out to me and I feel are, are worth mentioning and, and, and maybe discussing a little bit here. He, all, he says in the interview, he always expected Vince McMahon to come back. And, you know, he was, he was acting like, you know, Vince was, you know, uh, on a break. He was in Boca Raton, just, you know, taking a breather. Or, you know, he was acting like, you know, like, a, like an athlete when they get injured. You know, and, then, and then it's like, oh, well, well, he'll be back. You know, he'll be back. We'll just give him a couple of months. He'll rehab and he'll return. Um so he, you know, he was just acting like, you know, n nobody ever thought this was going to be permanent, you know, ignoring, you know, the letters uh, from Vince McMahon to the board of directors and, 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 and his own, the old, his own letters that his own board of directors sent, who voted unanimously for Vince to not return uh, and even talked about taking legal action if Vince returned. This is what he was talking about. And 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 he he tried to do this and this this is this was the I I find one of the major uh, uh one of the major blows to his credibility because he was acting like, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm a, a wrestler getting injured and the, oh, he'll be back and anyone who oh sure Roman has taken a, a leave for his health, but you know, if y'all are thinking he's going to sign with AEW, you're wrong. No one ever thought that he was going to sign with AEW. Like, this is what it felt like. But Nick was on this board. He was on this board of directors that unanimously told Vince in a written letter, we don't want you back. We will sue you if you come back. Unanimous means everyone is in agreement to this statement. Nick was on this board. And he's here sitting going, if you thought Vince was going to go away forever, you're, you know, you were wrong. You know, everyone knew he was going to come back. It's like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. And, and he said, the fans like it when people come back. As if he's act like, like this is a pro wrestling show, right? But it's not like, this is real. This is, the, you know, this is a, a, a this is a, 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 a a publicly traded company you're fucking with people's money here and their interest the, the their the interest that they have by investing their money by buying stock into this company it's not the same thing at all bill bodkin nice to see you and welcome he has this quote here as well our boy nick when you're on the inside you see things that may be coming my thought was that there's only one boss in the company, and that ain't me. I think it was always my point of view, Stephanie's point of view, he would come back. The way he played it to me was smart in that he went away for five, six months, which people, meaning the audience, seems to like when uh, somebody does that. And he came back and took control of the company as a company shareholder. So, it's, so it is the public's company and a pub, as a publicly traded company. But with that, the controlling share gives him a lot of authority and he used it and I applaud him for doing so. This is crony talk. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, this is, this is, this is crony talk. This is, it might as well be Bruce Pritchard <laughs> in this interview at this point. You know what I mean? And that's what I mean when I say his, this is a shot at his credibility. Because every action that the board of directors leading up to Vince's return proved exact, proved to be exactly the opposite of what he's saying here. And he's coming off as a goof. He's coming off as a goof. Because he's, he's right there saying, well, we all knew he'd be back. Why the fuck did you put... Who the, who's the unanimous then? unanimously the board said we don't want you back it wasn't you know 75 percent of the board say yay and uh 24 nay and one percent abstain there was none of that bullshit and then more egregiously when he was asked about the rita chatterton case 
Nick Khan, who already knew at this point the case had been settled, right? He, I believe in the timeline, and chat, correct me if I'm wrong here, if you, if you have quick access to this information here, but I feel like this, like the, the podcast was recorded before the Wall Street Journal um, report had come out. Saying that Chatterton had settled. So we didn't know that it was settled at the moment that, or, or at least it was recorded under the pretext that, uh, it was recorded under the pretext that uh, the the allegation that it hadn't, that it hadn't been reported that, the, uh, that Vince had settled, is what I'm trying to say. Correct. Thank you. But nonetheless, despite the fact that we didn't know at that moment, Nick knew. Nick had to know. Nick had to know that Vince had uh, that, that that Vince had settled. I, I I think it would be belligerently idiotic for him then to turn around and say, "I had no idea Vince McMahon had settled." It's like fuck you, right? Like at this point, it'd be a big old fuck you. I'm going off course. When he was asked about Rita Chatterton's rape allegations. Nick Khan said, quote, I think everyone's just plowing ahead. Very poor choice of words here. Because in all these businesses, there's never a clean, clear path. There's always some encumbrance, something in the way, some hurdle in the way that you have to get around or get through. So I see that like I see any other item like it. And this is where I think Nick Khan is at his poorest. He's thinking of this like a like a little like a little incident, like a little a little bumpy bump in the road. You know, it's like oh, you know, let's say the company was unionized. The union has given us some issues. You know, they want to you know they want to make sure that the workers get more protections. That's a bump in the road. What we have here is a serious allegation. A serious allegation. And Vince has a past of other allegations. There are so many things here that made this comment, that, that made this situation extremely disappointing because it's not just one thing that you can toss aside. This is a very serious allegation. It could potentially have been a criminal act. And you're just, oh, well, you know what? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sometimes you, there's a bump in the road. You got to swerve to the left when you want to go, when you want to turn to the right. And how many allegations are there? Like, you know, we're talking, you know, whatever you want to call it, right? Sexual misconduct, inappropriate relationships, sexual harassment, sexual assault, rape. All of these words, all of these words are connected in one form or another to Vince McMahon. Because don't forget, as far as we know, there are seven events. There are seven different events that, in, that, are in, that, that, in, that, 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 that relate to any of those terms that I just added there, right? There's, there's Rita Chatterton. That's the only one, by the way, who, uh, whose name is out there in public. And I'm not chastising anyone for... for for not good. that's not the point it's like Rita Chatterton is the only face that we have on these allegations then after that there's like there's a former wrestler there's a former manager there's a former contractor the tanning salon the spa resort lady and uh uh, uh the paralegal which was ultimately the one that that, that kicked off right so that so there's seven of these allegations six NDAs seven allegations I, I know Nick Khan is a smart guy and he's the CEO. So he's not going to come out here and trash the company. Like whatever his true thoughts are, we don't know what they are. Because his true thoughts, may, uh, maybe these are what they, you know, but maybe he's like, maybe he's, he's a little grossed out by it all. But he's like, look, I'm the CEO. And I'm going to come out here and I, 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 you know, 
I can't, I can't trash the company. I got to show that, you know, oh no, everything's going well. We're still strong. We united front, all that shit. But he has to realize that Vince is a liability, right? He has to. He can't be that, like, he can't be that dense. This is why Vince wanted, this is what I was saying earlier. This is why Vince wanted the Chatterton stuff buried into a, um, into a settlement because otherwise the, the more you simmer this thing, it, it starts off as a simmer, turns into a boil, right? Because we have, like I said, six other events that we can talk about and those are just the ones we know about. Vince has a pattern. He's a serial abuser. We know this because he pays, he pays women to shut them up. So what about all the other circumstances that we don't know about? And there are probably others. I think it is reasonable. I'm not saying that it is a fact, but I'm saying that it is reasonable to believe that Vince has more than just what we know out there, that he has a nice jam-packed closet full of these skeletons that we just don't know about. So he doesn't want that out there. So it's bad for Vince, it's bad for the company, it's bad for Nick. And Nick, what have I been telling you guys and gals and non-binary pals for weeks now, for for week, for since last year in the Nick Khan is a shark. Isn't that exactly the term I've been using? Nick Khan is a shark. He wants success and he wants the money that goes with it and he is going to he's going to put his talents behind whoever can get him to that level of success. When he's done with WWE, his contract is up in 2025. I feel like he's, you know, he's got 2 years left on his contract. When he's done, he's gone. He, he's not going to stick around wrestling. This is a guy I'm convinced he has aspirations to be like at the head of fucking NBC Universal, at the head of uh, Disney. Like this this guy's a shark. That's all that matters to him. And, and you know, who cares about, you know, morality? Who cares about being right or wrong if it impedes on the road to my success? It's just a bump. It's an obstacle. It's not relevant. It's not touching my bottom line. It's not touching my career tra trajectory. I'm a shark. And I'm going to shark the whole way through. I'm going to eat up who... I'm just going to gobble up Everyone who needs to be eaten up. Again, don't forget, this is a guy who was on the board of directors. Who was on the board of directors, wrote the, the letter on December 27 to Vince McMahon saying that they unanimously agreed that Vince should not come back to the company and they will pursue litigation if he does. So was Stephanie. So was Paul Levesque. And now he's sitting here saying, oh yeah, Vince is coming back. Fucking great thing. Best thing for the sale. Obstacles. Blah, 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 blah. You know, it, it, it. there are, you know, there, 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 there are other rules for millionaires and billionaires folks there's no accountability the system is the system fails the system fails those who are wronged uh by these people because they, oh it's a payout you, you can't fight these people they've got too much money so you might as well take the payout it it, it, it fails it fails the majority of of us it fails a guy like jay briscoe just like i was talking about earlier it feels a guy like Jake Briscoe who spent the rest of his life trying to tr the rest of his life trying to make amends for a mistake for something he said, making amends, regaining trust, and will still be brushed away by uh, by people in upper spheres. But guys like Vince, like Dana White, ah, history of terrible behavior and potentially criminal behavior. It's all, it's all going to be set aside. 
Again, like I said, you know, Nick is not going to, uh, he's not going to, he's not going to bury the company. It's like uh, Brandon Thurston said on, on, on WrestleNomics uh, this, this past weekend, again, the weekly WrestleNomics plug, you need to follow those guys. Um, it was all about Nick. This interview was all about Nick Khan saying, you know what? Everything is fine, folks. Everything is normal. Business as usual. No big things happening here, which is, one sh- which is what a shareholder wants to hear. Because if it, if the CEO goes on a uh, on a uh, to conduct an interview and start shaking the, the the boat and saying, "Hey, you know what? You know maybe Vince coming back wasn't such a good idea." Well, that news sort of spreads. If your chief executive says that, that's not good news for for, for shareholders. They're going to start selling. Price is going to drop. Vince coming back was um, was to be expected, folks. Didn't you know that? He was meant to come back. If you thought he wasn't coming back, you're dumb. And good job. Good job, Nick. But his credibility absolutely took a hit on this one. 100% took a hit. Let's talk about the Royal Rumble. How about that? Let's have some fun. WWE Royal Rumble PLE is happening this weekend. It is an exciting time of year. You know what? The Royal Rumble. Not, uh, not, not going to lie. It is my, it is my uh, uh, systematically my favorite WWE event every year. It's the one I look the most. Uh, I look forward to the most. It is the one that uh, creates the most. Uh, um, the most excitement among fans. I think it's always a good time, except the 2022 Royal Rumble, which was a complete disaster. Both of them stunk. The women's and the men's. It was just bad. Uh, so it can't be worse than 2022, right? Right. So when we're going to be staring this down this Saturday, January 28th, from the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Texas, I think we're all going to be excited about this. Uh it's a sellout from what I understand, right? Or very close to. There are not many tickets left. It's going to be a big, big gate again. And it should. It should. Like, this is the thing. Is like, it absolutely has to be a big gate for WWE. It's, the, it's one of their top four biggest shows of the year. And I think, historically speaking, the only show that makes more money than, uh, than WrestleMania is... Uh, live gates, I mean, is the Royal Rumble because people love them. Some Royal Rumbles. There's a lot of stuff. You know, uh, we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to get into the the matches. You know, the you know because every who's who are the big surprises. That's what everyone wants, right? It's like surprises, 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 surprises. You know, just look at that. You know. David Bixen span on Twitter is like, wait, there's only like, there's only like uh, uh, 15 men announced for the Royal Rumble on 30. And I was joking. I was like, hey, you got all these surprises. You need place for the surprises because that's all you hear. What surprises are going to come? Surprises. Surprises, surprises. It's like, like Shane McMahon. <laughs> Before, look. Let's talk about the, the, the non-Rumble matches. There are three non-Rumble matches that have been announced. And I, th- and I, th- I don't think there's going to be another one added. I don't think. Uh, you know, the, the Rumbles are easily an hour, right? They're, they're, they're significantly long matches. So I don't see uh, any more than three matches being added here. But... Uh, Let's let, you know. Let's go over them here. Bianca Belair will be defending the WWE Raw Women's Championship against Alexa Bliss. Um, as a casual viewer of WWE, <laughs> which, which is the audience they want, right? Um, I, uh, I I I don't see I don't see what the what the what the angle what the thing is here, and not angle in the. Storyline in the storyline equivalent sense. I mean, like, 
what's how should I approach this? What's the interest? What's what's other than Bianca getting getting a defense here against a former champion? And you know, I'm you know, at the risk of being chased after with torches and pitchforks, you know, I I I feel like Alexa Bliss is regressing. I feel like she's uh I don't mm, I you know, I don't want to I don't want to Ronda Rousey her cuz Ronda stunk. But I I am I am uh very cautious in regards to this performance coming up at the Royal Rumble against Bianca who is a total package and who can absolutely go um you know I I think that uh I think that Alexa has um she has some shortcomings I think they're a little glaring I don't think uh, she's uh I don't think she's as motivated let's put it that way as she once was I think she phones in a lot of stuff I think her energy level is very low um, maybe she's seeing the writing on the wall for her in WWE. Maybe this is a last ditch thing. I hear say, I hear say that she's going to, uh, that she's, uh, including herself in, or being included in some lore, some Bray Wyatt lore. Uh, what did she tell, uh, Bianca last night on Raw? She said, I don't need Bray Wyatt or Uncle Howdy to tear your face apart or something like that. And um, <laughs> uh, and I, uh, I I I don't I'm I I I don't know if she's if I, I don't know what they're trying to do with it. and you know what having Bianca Belair be in the ring and seeing Alexa Bliss on screen cutting that promo from behind and then Bianca looking worried I'm like Bianca come on now Ms. I I don't know man. There my my interest level for this one is very low. Um and uh, and I'm hoping that this lull that they have in uh Bianca Belair's current championship run is reignited at once we hit the high road to WrestleMania, the highway the 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 speedway the freeway the uh, the information super highway to WrestleMania. I hope that I hope it reinvigorates Bianca because uh, she's too special a talent to be in middling programs like this. I I, I don't think it does her it does her any service here. Oh, Matt Ritter. The Smackin' It Raw podcast. I miss you too. Next, we have Bray Wyatt, who is going to have his first match since WrestleMania 37, WrestleMania 38, WrestleMania, uh, uh, WrestleMania, what is it? Whatever. <laughs> Wrestle, WrestleMania 2. Gonna have his first match back against LA Knight in a Mountain Dew pitch black match. Um I like all of you, I have no idea what this entails. Uh all I can honestly, sincerely, truly, with all with my deepest heart, I hope that it is not something that is conducted with uh with wacky light um uh, associations you know I, I i i don't i i hope it it doesn't i hope it because i i i at the end I, at the, the 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 red lighting for the fiend back then was a was a downer for me i couldn't do it anymore uh and uh so i Look, I don't know. Does it? Are they going to wrestle with sacks on their head? Maybe. Again, would not necessarily be a good thing. Um, I've never seen a you know a, a thoroughly great uh, blindfold match. 
I don't know what to think about this. I really don't. And as a casual WWE viewer, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't get it. I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not super invested into it. And again, I'm. I was a Bray Wyatt guy. I thought. I thought. I thought. The the fire Firefly Funhouse was such a great revival. Here, I I don't understand what this is. <laughs> Loser dumps gets dumped in a vat of Mountain Dew Black, and they all their would that that would equally be the best and the worst outcome if that was the if that was the stip. Because <laughs> at least you'd see the match, but then is it? Look, I mean, I. I don't want to do. Uh, I don't want to uh, unnecessarily like throw shade at this. How can you throw shade that is at something that is already in the dark? But um, I am. I'm not a fan of this. Uh, of you know the Uncle Howdy stuff. I I think it's overextended. I know a lot of people think it's great storytelling, but I someone needs to explain to me how how is it that you know uh, someone has to tell me how something is a story when the story never progresses, you know, because we're still at the same spot. Nothing, nothing changes. Um, so I'm coming in. I'm coming into this saying that it this match is going to have. All the elements that I really, really don't like about WWE. And hopefully, hopefully, it will over-deliver from my expectations. My expectations are pretty low coming into this one. Because I, I, I can just see like, you know, lights going out and then weird stuff happening and teleportation and, uh, you know, goo and people, you know, tearing their way through, uh, tearing their way from under a ring, you know, and or, you know, a, a, a box-shaped object, a large box-shaped object being carried to the to ringside, you know, all of this stuff. You know, I, 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 it, it, everything in regards to this is, 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 is has the potential to make me angry <laughs> I am but if we want to stick to wrestling though I'm very excited to see how Bray Wyatt is going to fare uh, um, you know they had him do some 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 house shows which is a good idea get the rust off get ready for the for the big one and you know when he did the um, the the Firefly Fun House thing on on Friday he um he he wore his uh, his Mr. Rogers uh it's not a Mr. Rogers shirt by the way. I know we call it the Mr. Rogers shirt but it's not it's a V-neck but you know, which was tight and 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 he slimmed down quite a bit cuz it, it, the, the the V-neck is always was always very tight on him, the cashmere type thing, very tight around his body. And when he was doing it a couple of years ago, uh you know, rotund gentleman is him, but he's He's uh he's slimmed down considerably. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, good for him getting himself back uh, back into to shape. Will he be in ring shape? Cross our fingers. We hope so. Um, God bless LA Knight. I mean, he's done the best he could in this situation. Uh, we'll see how things go. Look, maybe I'll end up. Maybe maybe we'll have an early contender for match of the year. We just might. We just might. I don't... If there's shit that happens post-match, there's a post-match angle and stuff, I don't mind that. And, you know, then, then you, you know, trot out the, the you know, the, the teleportation and whatnot, and, and, and I'm okay with that. But when it impacts the story in the ring, what's going on in the ring, and you have to sort of... Pull shit back and you're like, wait a second, hang on a second. Wait a second. What are, what are we doing here kind of thing? I'm like, you know, kind of like the, and I know, I know a lot of people loved it, loved it, loved it. But for me, like for me, the finish of the men's war games match took me out of it. It was like, all everything that you're trying to do here could have been a 
what could have been done post-match instead of me believing that for a full like three minutes there were four other guys that couldn't come to the rescue of Kevin Owens, right? It's like, anyway. So this is what I'm, 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 I'm hoping we get stuff that happens after the match and we get like a conclusion in the match, and, but, but I'm not holding my breath, crossing my fingers, kissing them, sending them off into the universe. Go, good luck kissies. Go ensure that the World Wrestling Entertainment, you, you know, does something that I like here. You never know. One match that I am looking forward to is Roman Reigns versus Kevin Owens for the Undisputed Universal Championship. I mean, look, straight out the bat, we're all, I think we're all in agreement. Roman's not dropping the title, right? Because the biggest intrigue of them all is who is Roman facing at WrestleMania for the, for the titles. Uh, for, uh, so, I mean, there's no... I, I, Unless there's something, you know, someone has this 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 deep uh, uh, analysis that I'm not aware of. Uh, there's no way Kevin Owens is winning here. But I am extremely excited at the idea of this match because Kevin Owens is one of the best wrestlers out there in North America doing it day week in, week out. And Roman, Roman it, it works very well with them. I loved the matches that they had towards the end of the Thunderdome era a couple of years ago, I thought they had, I think these guys have fantastic chemistry and they're going to go and they're going to put on a hell of a show. So I'm fully expecting this match to deliver. I think it'll be very good. I'm excited for it. Now, will, will the, uh, will uh, the, the bloodline Sami Zayn stuff be able to keep its way out of the match until the end? And probably not. Probably not. I mean, you know, the, uh, the bloodline storyline has been all about for the I think for the past eight months uh, it has all been about uh, you know Sami Zayn. Oh, he's okay with us now. Oh, now he's no longer okay with us now. Oh, now he's okay with us now. Now he's no. I think this is the third time that Sami is uh, what, you know the trial. I think this is the third time that Sami was not okay. Right? I think. So, uh, look, I, I, again, you know, it's, I have apprehensions. I hate having apprehensions going into these matches because I, I wish I could just be like, yeah, I mean, this is going to rule and they're going to, it's going to rule right up until a certain point where WWE will get into its own way. You know what I mean? That's what, that's what bothers me, but hopefully not. Hopefully they can get, keep the, the nonsense at a minimum or non-existent, and then when the bell rings, then when the bell rings, do all the Sami Zayn goofiness that you want, do all the Jey Uso, uh, Jey Uso is sticking up for Sami Zayn stuff that you want, and Roman doesn't care for it much, and Paul Heyman's, uh, you know, he's doing these wild facial expressions, Ooh, let's do all of that after the ring, after the match is done, like, uh, let's enjoy a wrestling match, you know what I mean? But... I think the road to that finish is going to be pretty fun. I'm excited. This is a match I'm legitimately looking forward to. It should be very good. I think Roman retains. By the way, I think, you know, Bianca's going to retain. Bray Wyatt is going to win. Although, I absolutely 100% could see them, you know, having the match just be a non-finish. You know, just like when, you know, Uncle Howdy comes out and then he disappears during a commercial break, you know. And it's like, what happened? It's like, you know. Something could happen in this match and the match will just finish. There won't be a ring, you know, there won't be a bell, there won't be a decision, it'll just, it'll just disappear. But yeah, no, Bray Wyatt, Roman Reigns, Bianca Belair, they all win. Now let's talk about the Rumble matches. A lot of stuff. I like the Royal Rumble. Again, I, you know, I think last year was a, uh, I think last year was a, um, uh, was a, uh, a, a a step in the wrong direction. Of course, there was a lot of a lot of reports that came out afterwards that you know Shane McMahon came in last minute and he wanted to book himself as the winner. And then, you know there was a lot of there was a lot of nonsense leading up to the to the final, right to the very end. Don't, don't, if we if we don't if, if we recall. So here, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes at this point, uh, we, uh, as far as we know, Shane McMahon's not involved. As 
as we know, as of right now, today, these are the gentlemen who are entered in the Men's Royal Rumble. Cody Rhodes, Kofi Kingston, Ricochet, Bobby Lashley, Seth freaking Rollins, Austin Theory, Gunther, Drew McIntyre, Sheamus, Omas, Braun Strongman, Baron Corbin, Santos Escobar, Rey Mysterio, and Karrion Cross. So that is 15, it's half of the, um, it's half of the field that is out there uh, and that has been announced. And again, you know, like I was saying a little earlier, it's like, oh, what about the surprises? That leaves a room for a lot of surprises, Warren. Well, you, it's also, you have like a, uh, you know, a, a roster of 40 other dudes that you could still add to there. And there's only 15 spots. You know, there's, there's plenty of guys who haven't been announced who can still be there. You know, I, you know, the Miz being one of them that could be uh, entered into this, into this match. I know Gunter is there. Where are his boys? Where, uh, where are uh, 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 the uh, the the uh, uh, Fantasmo uh, El Fantasmo Legada del Fantasmo crew? There's a whole you know. There's a whole bunch of people there. As far as I go, you know, I, you know, if you if you wanted to give like a a legitimate surprise, like something where you go. You know, I would absolutely think that Kaiji Muto, Great Muda, I think it would he would be, uh, it would be a logical fit for him. He's on his way out of pro wrestling. His final match is in February coming up. We're going to talk about that. Coming up in February is his final last retirement match. I think he's practically a shoe in to be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame alongside Vince McMahon. <laughs> oh, that's a discussion for another time. Um, but no, but, but seriously, uh, you know, uh, just like they did with um, with uh, Jushin Thunder Liger, right? That they inducted him when he retired. The difference here is that Liger had one match in NXT, which is, which is fine. Um, whereas Muda never wrestled for WWE, but he has wrestled for WCW on multiple occasions. So, you know, if they just wanted to get the quote-unquote criteria out of the way that he had to wrestle at least a WWE match, well, have him come into the Royal Rumble. It's his farewell, his farewell tour. You know, the, you know, the people, people are saying, yeah, but he can't bump. Do you really expect him to take a, to take a dive, uh, you know, to be thrown over the top rope? And land on the floor, kind of thing. It's like not entirely wrong, but you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of mysticism and 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 magic powers that exist in WWE, right? Uh, you know, WWE is a nexus point of uh, of 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 cosmic energies and mystical powers. So you could absolutely you could absolutely have you know um, uh, the great Muda. Who is you know a you know a spirit entity himself? He's you know he teleports via mist. You know he could like come in the ring, spit mist at someone, and then the lights go off and he's you know at the top of the ramp. Oh, he exited the ring. His feet touch the floor. He's gone. Like uh, you know, there's a lot of things you could do. There's there's a lot of things you could do to cover to cover that. I don't think I don't think Kaiji Muto. Uh, I don't think Kaiji Muto not taking a bump excludes him from being in the Royal Rumble because WWE could figure out a way to uh, to make it work. And I think it makes sense. You know, with the exchange with uh, Pro Wrestling Noah, not New Japan. Folks, Noah, Pro Wrestling Noah is, is the arrangements that, uh, that WWE took. Okay? Not New Japan. We were having a we were having a laugh earlier today on uh, on Twitter about uh, what if Tetsuya Naito <laughs> is in the Royal Rumble, right? You know, and it takes six six entrants later he started unfastening his belt from his from his entrance gear, like he's just, you know tranquilo. <laughs> he comes in at number thirteen. 
he comes in at number 29 once he's done disrobing. And actually, that, it'd be really funny. Uh, but, I, you know, I think I think that Muto makes a lot of sense. I know a lot of people are expecting, hoping for Dwayne Johnston, the Rocks, to join the uh, to join the proceedings. There's been a lot of reports floating around that. Um, there's been a lot of reports floating around that. Uh, no, it turns out he's not going to be able to make it. Oh, he, he won't be able to make it on time. He's not. He's not. Uh, he's not. Uh, he's not in shape. He's not in, in good enough ring shape to get to the ring. And people are like, well, the motherfucker's jacked. This is, well, that's not what it means. Because there's, there's really a difference between, you know, maintaining your physique and, you know, staying strong and whatnot and, you know, going to the gym to work out and training to get back in the ring to wrestle. It, you know, being in shape and in ring shape are similar things, but are still different. Um, in the sense that you know you you know your body's not used to taking bumps anymore, you know maybe your timing is off, maybe your moves aren't as crisp. You know the, you need some time. You need some time to warm yourself back up. You need to get back into the swing of things. I'm thinking, you know, well, maybe he's maybe he is not quite ready. But haven't the uh, what? <laughs> They've been talking about this for about a year and a half now at this point, about The Rock showing up at WrestleMania. Are you telling me that uh, that we're still not set, that we're still not entirely sure, and that The Rock is like, well, it's too late now because I haven't been hitting the gym, I haven't been sparring with any training partners, and it's been like 18 months. Like, if I'm Paul Levesque, I'm calling The Rock, and I'm saying, hey, you... We talked about this like over a year ago and you're telling me you haven't started training yet? And The Rock says, no, brother, I can't do it. You know, it's like, it's, Honestly, it's a little fishy. It's a little fishy. And I'm not, you know, I'm not here to piss in anyone's cornflakes. I'm not going to say, I, I'm not going to call anyone who's, who's expecting The Rock to return to be, to be like, no, you're completely wrong. You're entirely off, off mark. I don't think so. I think there's a, uh, I think there's a, a a a strong argument to be made that he um, that I think there's a strong argument that he might not be there. I think that it's actually stronger than he will be there because most of the arguments that I hear about that that that, that I hear from people telling me, "Oh, the Rock is going to be there," and I'm like, "Well, why? What makes you think that he's going to be there?" Was well, well, the, the WrestleMania is in Los Angeles this year. Okay. <laughs> like I, I get it, I understand the connection. But if that is your number one, like your top uh, reason for believing that Dwayne the Rock Johnson is going to return, uh, I'm going to need a little more than that, you know. Just like on the other side, where it's like, oh, well, it doesn't look like he's ready, so on and so forth. And it's funny because. It's funny because, uh, you know, we've 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 gone through this very recently with um, very recently with uh, Mercedes Vernado, Mercedes Money. She was, uh, you know, where everyone was saying, "Oh, she's going to be a dynamite, right? She's going to be a dynamite. She's going to be a dynamite. She's going to be a dynamite," and she didn't show up at dynamite, despite the fact that they were telling us on TV, "My partner is you know, Soraya's mystery partner. Ah, it's going to be Tony Storm." And everyone until the very end was like, no, she's going to be there. She's going to be there. Not everyone, but a lot of people. And then when she didn't show up, they said, Arr! And here, in this case, I, I, but you know, look, I want to nuance because there is a, you know, there is the fact that Britt Baker did the interview where she, you know, she said, you know, she called herself the boss and she winked and you're like, that could have been a breadcrumb and I, I can get behind that. But here we have another situation where it's like, uh, WWE is teasing, you know, they, they put up the full WrestleMania match from a couple of years ago when uh, I can't remember which one because I'm terrible with WrestleMania numbers. Um, uh, the one where Roman uh, won at the end and The Rock was there to ho hold his hand up and, you know, was the infamous one where Roman was getting booed and The Rock was looking around. and um, 
and and nostalgia nostalgia is 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 a real thing and it is very it animates WWE fans quite a bit it is a it is a strong it is, nostalgia is a very strong scent for WWE fans so you know there's a lot of things that they are latching on to that at the same time a lot of them were criticizing Mercedes Monet fans to be latching on to. I just want everything to be fair and square and everyone to just be logical, but I know that's that's impossible and I live in a fantasy world, you know. Um, but but there's a lot there's a lot of stuff that there are a lot of parallels that could be drawn that could that could be drawn here because uh, this is not a situation from Survivor Series from last year where was it last year? I mean 2021, right? When it was the Rock's Survivor Series, right? The Rock's anniversary in WWE. And no, WWE never said that The Rock was going to be there. But holy smokes, right? Oh boy. And I mean, there's, you know, there's certainly incentives business-wise for, for, for The Rock to do this. I mean, if he shows up in LA and we're getting attendance records you know for wrestlemania uh attendance records uh, 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 uh records for for gates maybe maybe Dwayne is going to be like oh well you know i might as well show up and uh, push it over the edge a little bit and then take a little credit for it going back and yeah, it's good for my rep cuz you know the opposite isn't better but we already know wrestlemania is selling really well but the opposite is like like if it if it turns out to be oh well you know the stadium was full at 70% capacity not even the rock could draw <laughs> that's not good either you know what i mean but the wrestlemania is selling really well so it's it's a bit of a moot point uh i really don't know where to fall on this uh but you know i think that um I think there's a there's a lot of rose colored glasses when it comes to this kind of stuff and WWE fans. I I I don't see the excitement of Rock coming back for any type of run. I don't see how it serves long term. I know everyone's going to tell me, but Warren, the casual fans, going to tune in. Tune in. I was like, if you say so. These mythical casual fans, right? That uh, that apparently are that apparently already watched the show. Have I told you my theory about the casual fan and the the, the, the ratings pops and you know because everyone keeps telling me right you do a raw 20 or raw 30 like you did it's gonna bring in the casual fan and they did a huge number 2.3 million last night and fantastic for real but you know I don't think it's I don't think it's sustainable I think we're back to normal levels for raw next week and I think that what you're doing is that you're bringing back, uh, you're bringing back to watch your pro. You're bringing the hardcore fans in. I, so many people have spent so many years telling me that WWE caters to little kids, families, casual fans, and when they pop a number, well, they're actually bringing in. In my estimation, they're bringing in the hardcore fans. Guys, maybe a little more like me and gals and non-binary pals. Let's not be reductive here, Warren. Who uh, who watch other types of wrestling and who are much more interested in other types of wrestling than what the the WWE has to offer. And uh, and when you see a big event, a Raw Thirty, well, then it does pique your curiosity. Oh, they have all these these older. Uh, they have all these legends coming out. Oh, and by the way, they stack the card. They have a nice big stack card as well. They're doing the bloodline thing. Okay, this is a big show. I can, I'll can i tune in to watch a big show. But I won't be back next week. I won't be back, you know, to, to get more, you know, Dexter Loomis stuff. I, that's not what I want. That's not why I watch wrestling. So I, I sincerely believe that when they, they pop these numbers, these aren't these mythical casuals. I think they already have them. I think there's they're, 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 the audience that they have is the casual wrestling audience. The hardcore, the, uh, the hardcore audience is when they come in. 
That's when they do these that when they do these events and they pop these numbers, it's because people like me are gonna sit down and I'm gonna make a point to watch it. Same thing with John Cena coming in on a Friday night on SmackDown. I'm like, oh wow, ah, John Cena. Let's see what he's gonna do. You know, I'm curious. I'm like, I wanna see what John Cena's gonna do in the year of our Lord 2023. 2022 in this case. Why were we talking about? Oh yeah, so the Rock, so the Rock, so so you know, so then that's the thing. Then everyone is like, well, oh the casual fan, the casual fan. Well, I think again, I don't think it's a question of the casual fan. I don't even think it's casual fans. Maybe a little more. Maybe you'll have people because Dwayne. I think Dwayne would be an exception because of how big of a fucking movie star he is. I think he might be an exception, but I think you're going to get back a lot of uh, hardcore wrestling fans who are going to tune in maybe a little more often. I think. Because it fascinates me when then people are like, who do you think, uh, do you think the, who do you think is going to, uh, who do you think is going to, uh, to, to remain the, um, who's going to uh, win at WrestleMania, The Rock or, or Roman Reigns? And I'm like, is this the main event you want? Is that really the main event you want for the titles? Of course, WrestleMania is two nights, so you can do, you, you know, you can do Roman and another guy in Roman versus The Rock. You could do that. But is that, is that really what you want? And, and, and isn't that more of an indictment of the state of WWE than anything else? But again, like, I, you know, I've come around on WrestleMania and I've, you know, I've talked about this a few times and I'm going to reiterate my, my, my thought here. So, you know, WrestleMania is not, is not a, a, an event for 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 fans it is a, a for wrestling fans necessarily it's a spectacle it's a show and people coming there want a show people who come in to watch the super bowl want the show they want the spectacle of a huge football game they have the halftime thing and so on and so forth it's not about the game in and about itself it's about the event and wrestlemania is about the event so it it's it's not even it's not even surprising that that WWE fans now are conditioned to say, yeah, The Rock versus Roman is the match we want, whereas anyone else within the company, they feel like it's a, it's a step down. And as, you know, if you take a step back as a fan, you're like, that's an indictment. But then again, that's not what WrestleMania is for. WrestleMania is the show. It's the big thing. It's the big spectacle you want to... to you, 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 you want the big attraction. Well, the big attraction is The Rock. And it's against Roman. And I get it. Like, on that level, I get it. But as a wrestling fan, I'm like, I don't understand. I don't understand why you'd go with that. I don't see, I, I, I don't see how it's a proper payoff. I don't see how it benefits the roster. I don't think, I don't see how it benefits anyone within the next few years. It's The Rock. I mean, I get it. So will he look if he shows up it's going to be enormous it's going to be a huge deal it, it, it will sincerely be a tremendous event and I for for WWE fans I I sincerely hope it happens I really do like I honestly hope it happens because there's a lot of people who would be overjoyed by it and wrestling should bring you joy it really should. It shouldn't make you mad like with the cage match last night on Raw 30. It really shouldn't. That's, that was a disaster. And anyone who's pissed... I was pissed off at it. I was pissed off at it and I was... And, and, and I, I, unfortunately, I had family business to attend to last night. Well, unfortunately. I, unfortunately, I didn't see the entirety of Raw 30. I caught up with it early later today. But when I saw... The reactions online, and I was like, I was in complete dismay, complete dismay that everything had sh that that they had uh, cut the the women's cage match, Becky and uh, and uh, Bailey, which was supposed to last o two segments, right? Was supposed to last over a commercial, something that they had touted it's like first time that they ever meet that they wrestle in twenty years, first uh, women's cage match. Look, whatever, like. You just they put this over big time and they scrap it because the because the bloodline thing went long and because we really had to get we really had to get the poker segments in right what did i tell y'all last week i i call cuz it's the same thing every time 
No um, poker, and then someone's gonna play poker, and he's gonna get swindled by one of the uh, one of the old guys. And then you're gonna have Ron Simmons come in. He's gonna go, damn. And then we come, and then we move on, right? I mean that it happened like clockwork. But we had to get, we had to fucking get, you know, Mike Rotunda on TV. We had to have that happen. We had to have another Cody pre-tape. Oh, did you know, by the way, Cody was injured? I don't know if you heard about that. Cody was hurt. Did you, did you, have you heard about that? Now we had to make sure you understood that. And then, of course, what you sacrifice is the women's match, right? And to be frank, to be completely honest with you, it is a perfect full circle moment if you're celebrating 30 years of Raw to disrespect the women talent on TV. I mean, it's a full circle moment for Raw, right? You couldn't have a better tribute to the women than just uh, toss them aside, right? Makes perfect sense. Perfect celebration. Because you have to have time for, you know, road dog shambling his way to the ring, doing his sing-along. You need time for that. Don't get me wrong. The bloodline thing was, it's an all-timer segment. It was a lot of fun. It was very well done. I thought it was a little long. I thought, I think it could have been shortened. I think the execution was a little long. It's an all-timer segment. It was great. But yeah, look, as far as the men go, I think the biggest surprise they probably have up their sleeve is The Rock. They, you know, look, they have the legends around. They might, you know, they have a whole bunch of them that they just popped in. You know, they might have Kurt Angle run in to do a thing. I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't think there's going to be as many surprises as people think. Um, you know, and everyone's, oh, well, they'll bring up a bunch of people from NXT. They didn't do it last year. It's been a while since they haven't done, like, people from NXT showing up on the, like, a whole bunch of them, right? Or at least a handful, I should say. But maybe, maybe they'll bring up Braun Breaker, maybe? Don't tell Vince his name is Braun, just like Braun Strong, man. Then the other question is, is Sammy going to win? Well, Sammy's not going to win. <laughs> you know. You know, they, uh, Sammy's not going to win because that's not the plan. I, I, and I, I, like, I, what, I have been, I have been on this horse I have been on this horse for a, practically a year now and, and I'm still on it and I got off for a while or at least I was, you know, I was about to jump off because then I was thinking Seth Rollins because, it, but the man is Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes is still the guy who is going to, in my opinion, going to be the guy to beat Roman Reigns. Jey Uso, I promise you, if anything comes out, if anything comes out of this bloodline stuff, big if, the, 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 the path I see is Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens taking the titles off of the Usos. Because the interactions between Jay and Jimmy and Sami are much more significant and, and, uh, than, than the ones that he has with Roman on a regular basis because the betrayal will be stronger there because Jimmy look Jimmy stood up for him this week uh, Jay stood up for him this week Jay has been a proponent uh, Jimmy has been a proponent of Sami Zayn for a while and that to me the path is clear because there's not really I know everyone likes to say that oh such subtle storytelling but it's not it's pretty on the nose and I, let's say I am 90% convinced that this is the trajectory that's going to happen after we're, once we're done 
with the Royal Rumble. Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens are going to find a way to be a team again to rekindle their friendship. I feel. And Cody Rhodes is winning the Royal Rumble and going to WrestleMania. And the only proof you need, the only proof you need moving forward are all of those videos week after week for about a month now reminding us that Cody was injured. That Cody came back to do this for his dad because that was the first promo he cut on a Monday night after WrestleMania saying, I'm doing this for my dad because this was the title that's always eluded him. I'm coming back for one reason and that's to do this. Look at the entrance they gave him at WrestleMania. Do you not think that they don't think this guy is a superstar? And I don't think the plan has changed even though Vince is no longer in control. I think this still is the trajectory. This is still what they want. And they're letting Cody go out there and do his own thing. They, they, were, they were putting him in spots. This is the star they want. This is a guy that they can see holding the championship and being a media figure. And as much as the fans love Sami, Sam, and, and as much as I love Sami Zayn El Generico, as much as I love that guy, I don't think anyone is sitting around there going, yeah, scruffy bearded, wacky old Sami Zayn is the guy who's going to carry the title. I don't think, I, it's not, that's not it. That's not the plan. The plan is for y'all to be stabbed in the heart. Sami makes a full baby face turn. Teams up with Kevin Owens and they beat the Usos at WrestleMania for the titles. The bloodline falls apart. The bloodline falls entirely apart at WrestleMania. And I think Cody, I absolutely 100% still think that Cody's the guy. And it's been the guy. And anyone who's like, oh, it could be, it could be, could be The Rock. It's Cody's the guy. It might be, and and because of the videos, people are starting to to turn and go. Oh, could, could, Cody could be the guy. Cody has always been the guy, and that's an even further indictment as to how capable they are of building talent on the roster. Because once again, they have to turn to talent that has been a star outside of their company to be a superstar within their company. That's not, an, that's not a knock on Cody. Good for him. Congratulations even. Because <clears throat> he'll have come full circle on his own prophecy. It's to come from invisible to undeniable. Deniable to undeniable. What was it? Anyway. That'll be his thing, right? And, 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 and frankly, honestly... Do you really think that there is no one in WWE who would, who, that there is no one in WWE who is pushing to have a former top AEW guy win the title at WrestleMania? Do you, do you not think that that's not something that they enjoy? Come on now. Cody is my official prediction winning the Royal Rumble. It is the safe bet. I know I, I know a lot I know a lot of you are going in this with your heart and and a lot of people are making some very interesting comparisons. Are we gonna get a you know is is this gonna be a Batista Daniel Bryan uh uh yeah a Batista Daniel Bryan situation or is this going you know with Sami Zayn and, and Cody Rhodes? The best thing is to avoid having Sami be in the Royal Rumble, period, right? Keep Sami out of the Royal Rumble, that way no one will ever know. Uh, let, let's talk about the Women's Royal Rumble. As it stands right now today, seven official entrants. Liv Morgan, Raquel Rodriguez, Rhea Ripley, Candice LeRae, Shayna Baszler, Zelina Vega, and Emma. And again, people are looking at this and they're like, oh, there's so many... So much room for surprises, 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 surprises. So many surprises. surprises. There are so many women who are not, who are just, who are still on these rosters, but aren't on the, sh but I have absolutely have. Look, 
Let, let's run down everyone who is who is an active wrestler, active talent wrestler on the show, on both shows, on Raw and SmackDown, that just aren't in the in the Royal Rumble yet. On the Raw side, we have Asuka, Bailey, Becky Lynch, Dakota Kai, Dana Brooke, Io Shirai, Mia Yim, Nikita, uh, Nikki, <laughs> Nikki Cross, and Tamina. That's nine women, okay? And uh, Tamina's still on the roster. She's not gone. She hasn't been fired. So, uh, nothing, nothing. so uh, nine women here that can still be at it. There's Dewdrop as well who is uh, somewhere out there in the ether. Uh, she is taking some time off for some mental health issues. Uh, maybe it's coincidental that she might be back. Let's let's assume, let's just say she might return, okay? That would mean 10 women on the, um, 10 women just on Raw that could be added to the Royal Rumble, which would, instantly take us up to 17 total let's go look on the smackdown side we have bfab she, she's a wrestler bfab lacey evans uh ronda rousey uh scarlet although she hasn't been um she hasn't been featured as a wrestler she still potentially could so let, let's take her out for fairness sake, because she hasn't been presented as a wrestler on WWE, let's just say we'll take her out. We'll be fair. Uh, Sonya Deville, Tegan Knox, Valhalla, and Zia Lee. That's seven more women. That brings us up to 24. So all these surprises that we have that we have in store, that brings us to six potential wild card entrances. And that's excluding. Again, some women who were marked as injured, and I don't know what their status is, but for instance, Aaliyah, she's injured, she's out. Maybe she'll be back in time, I don't know. Natalia as well, she was getting some uh, reconstructive surgery on her nose, right? She got her nose busted open. Maybe she'll be back. And if Natalia, look, if Natalia is good to go, you know she's in the Royal Rumble. That's for sure. Shotzi, injured her hand? Something to that effect? Maybe she'll be back. That's three more women. Let's let's just have a little fun and say these these three women are added on top of that. So that brings us to what? Uh, 17, 24, 27. Uh, room for three surprises. What if Charlotte Flair is in the Royal Rumble? H has there been precedent? I'm trying to remember right now as we're talking. Has there ever been precedent? for a champion to be in the Royal Rumble. I believe so, right? I believe so. So she could be added in there. You know, she wins, she picks her opponent for WrestleMania. I think that's possible. So that's an extra person that brings us up to uh, 28, right? If I'm counting correctly. Am I keeping score? Does that make sense? Kristen in the chat, she's... She, she's stealing all my jokes. Well, one of my jokes. Because now we talk about surprises. Who, who are these surprises? What if Brandy Rhodes returns? I mean, she, she if, we, if, we, if we return, we go back in time to, uh, to the, you know, the, 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 uh, the Halcyon era of Rhodes to the top. Uh... Brandy was training for her return to the ring. Let us let's let's not let's not forget. She wanted another run. She wanted to prove every everyone wrong. I mean, you know, her guy her guy's returning. Why not uh why not have toss her back in there? You, honestly, I I why not at this point? Why not at this point just go ahead and throw her throw her into the mix? Um, Chelsea Green is out there as well, and from what we understand, she is currently signed with WWE. 
and she is uh, there. She's just waiting for creative to give her the green light to go. This is absolutely a Triple H move to reintroduce her at the Royal Rumble. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think that is absolutely something that can. And if I'm a betting guy, I don't know what the odds are on this, but I'd put some money on a Chelsea Green return. I feel I could make a cool amount of cash. I could get a good return on that uh, on that investment. There's always Oksana that I'm excited. To. I'm going to keep that dream alive. I'm going to keep that dream alive for former diva Oksana to return for one more night. Look, you know, there, there's... There's there's not a lot of room to bring up NXT women. You know, Roxy, uh, Roxanne Perez, excuse me. Uh, and, and who, Alba Fire. You know, like the, these are all women you could bring. You, you, those are a couple of women you could easily just like yoink up. Probably, um, you know, I look. I she's been she's been on on you know main roster, uh, you know, in the crowd. You know, Nikita Lyons. If you want to get if you want to get she, you know she, if you want to get people excited about her up on main that don't watch NXT, there's a good opportunity right there. You know, um, so you, there's just not a lot of spots because un, unless they absolutely decide to sacrifice. Uh, some women from main roster to make room for these surprises, which is also possible. But, you know, as as far as surprises go, I'd say Chelsea Green. And I think the biggest surprise that... Um, uh, I think the biggest surprise that they have in their pocket for this return is Naomi. I think that is unquestionably the biggest one that they have. Uh, because clearly Mercedes and Naomi have professionally gone their separate ways at this point. Um, but uh, that's absolutely the one. She will get a, an enormous reaction from WWE. It will be tremendous. And people will be legitimately excited to see, to, 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 it will be legitimately excited to see her. I don't know if she can make a bigger splash. Can... Can she make a bigger splash? That one year she came dressed out as uh, uh, I, uh, the 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 DC Comics superhero. I think it's Bumblebee. She's called. I'm not quite sure. Just, I don't want to say absolutely anything. Yes, it is Bumblebee. Okay, just wanted to make sure I, I got the right. But yeah, she because. Everyone lost their minds on that one. They were like, holy shit, she, you know, even people who weren't watching wrestling, who is this woman? Who is she? That was attracting attention. So my, I'm not afraid of, any, of her being a big surprise and coming back. The question is, will they be able to capitalize on Naomi returning, on making a big splash? That I, ha I have very little faith in world wrestling entertainment to do it because they've had Naomi at her hottest and they went in different directions. So I'm I'm not entirely convinced that they can do it. I really I'm I'm not. But I would like I think that would be a legitimately uh, I think that's the most legitimate uh fan favorite surprise that they have. Will probably be you know, they'll probably have a couple of divas I would have probably called for some you know, maybe some some Bellas, maybe, but <laughs> they haven't been they haven't been very kind to WWE over the past twenty four hours <laughs> in regards to to their to 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 what happened at at, at Raw thirty and the uh, how little uh, Raw thirty mentioned the women on the show and you know you could bring in a, you could bring in a Lita for a big pop you know I but I really think the biggest. The biggest one they have up their sleeve right now is Naomi. And that, you know, I, it will be significant in regards to what they do with her moving forward. So, there we go. Look, 
all said and done, surprises and whatnot, uh, I I think this is Rhea Ripley's uh, Royal Rumble to lose. I think I you know I think she she gets the most eliminations. I think she's dominant in this one. I think she I think they give her they give her the diesel push for this one. She gets the diesel spot and she just runs through everything moving forward. I, I, who else who else is potentially hot enough who hasn't been who who you know Becky doesn't need a Royal Rumble really to be in in, in any top spot on in, in the company maybe Bailey maybe Bailey sneaks um maybe ba- uh, Bailey sneaks by And I, I look. If there is, if there is one thing that can be said about the Royal Rumble is that you know a a, a well paced, well booked situation um, for 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 a new wrestler can create a new star, right? It can absolutely create a new star, and I think this is Rhea Ripley's moment because she is hot right now, very over. Plus, she can go. You know, I am of the uh, I am of the uh, the thought process that the um, the Judgment Day, the Judgment Day, is a vehicle to get Rhea Ripley over, and it's working. So that's my prediction: Rhea Ripley, and you know, she most eliminations on top of that. Oh, you know what? You know what? I'll even say for the coming back to the men's real quick. I, might even see Matt Cardona as a surprise in there. And maybe it's just a one-off thing. Maybe, but, but why not like have Matt Cardona run in? Chelsea's going to be there. Have him do just a one-off spot and then hit the bricks. <laughs> I, I think that'd be funny. All right. We are going to continue on this, this train We're going to talk about the New Japan Noah crossover show, the Wrestle Kingdom 17 Night 2 show, which was the official title. But is it is it really Night 2 if it's like two weeks later? I don't think so. You know, it's like when you start calling calling it WrestleMania backlash. We had this crossover show. Which was the second time, second year in a row, that New Japan and Noah do a a, 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 a a crossover show at the beginning of the year. They did one last year, which was fine. I thought it was a, I thought it was a, a an okay show, like nothing out of the ordinary, but uh, nothing out of the ordinary, uh, nothing exceptionally good, but uh, but not bad either. But there was like one memorable match on the card which was the multi-man lij versus congo match uh which spilled over into uh wrestle kingdom this year when all of a sudden uh you know we were told as we were watching the show that in the back lij had been confronted by there were members of congo the new noah faction were in the who were backstage and were they were cruising for a bruising and the LIJ guys were were standing up to them, and and like, oh okay, so we're, so this flowed over. They continued this this rivalry, which ended up having a a a, a true to form challenge during this card, the Noah Show, where uh, each member where where, where there was a, a basically a three out of five uh, war match. There were five LIJ Congo matches on the card. And whoever won the most uh, won bragging rights, essentially, or a bigger winner's purse or whatever. And throughout the rest of the evening, well, there were multi-man matches. But it was really interesting that this year, as opposed to having multiple multi-man matches like we had last year, this year we ended up getting uh, we ended up getting uh, 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 um, uh, uh, numerous singles matches, which I thought was really interesting made the card look uh, look hot feel hot and it was a good show 
Plus, on top of that, well, we'll get to it. Um, we had, uh, of course, uh, things opened up with the uh, with the pre-show, where we had uh, trainees starting this one off. Rookies Kosi Fujita and uh, Ryohei Oiwa defeated Taishi Ozawa and Yasutaka Yano. Fujita and Oiwa, of course, uh, young lions Ozawa and Yano coming out of the uh, coming out of the uh, Noah side of things. I I, th I actually thought this was a very good pre-show match, a good opener, good uh, mise en bouche here. Um, great ground game. Yano was controlling the arm with great hammer locks. Strong showing by the trainees here overall. Good fun match with a lot of intensity. I I enjoyed it tremendously. Jaco Robertson, good morning to you and welcome to the stream. Then the second pre-show match was Daiki Inaba and Masakitamiya from Noah. They defeated Tomohiro Ishii and Oscar Loibe. Is it Lube? I think that's how that's how Kevin Kelly pronounces it, but I feel like it's not exactly the per, the, the proper German way. L E U B E. I'm gonna have to look into it. Good little match that we had here as well. Where we had, uh, and, and I mean, the attraction here was uh, Kitamiya and uh, Ishii going at it. And uh, holy smokes, just fighting, going all fighting spirit on each other. That was a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's the kind of match, because, you know, essentially, con they're, they're, they're two very strong, compact brutes. Do so you want to see them beat the shit out of each other? Kitamiya gets the win, gets a Masasaito style key lock, a leg lock, key lock, excuse me, locked in. So um, he gets the win here. And after the match, which was great, like uh, Ishii was, he just wouldn't let any, any anyone of the Noah guys celebrate. He was pissed off. He was mad. He was getting in everyone's face. And this tension really carried throughout the entire match. You know, this is this is what was fun about this the show overall is that. Yeah, it was a crossover show. Everyone sort of was there to get along and put on a good show and, you know, make some money, as they say. But the kayfabe story here is that, you know, you're in, you're in our house. You know, the New Japan guy's going, you're in our house. Uh, we don't necessarily like you here. You're competitors. You're you're the enemy. I'm, uh, uh, we're, we're, not a, we're not super keen on having you here. And then, the, you know, the Noah guys feel that and they're like, yeah, well, screw you because we're, uh, we're going to show you what we're made of kind of thing. And don't forget, you know, New Japan is the biggest promotion in Japan. And, and by far, you know, the, the second biggest promotion in, in, in New Japan as far as live gates go, live attendance, is stardom. But by a significant margin, right? It's not like, oh, by, you know, a couple of, you know, $10,000. and No, 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 no. We're talking significant differences in, 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 in size and attendance and revenue. Um, no one doesn't even crack the top three. The top three is New Japan, Stardom, and, and Dragon Gate. So Noah is pretty low on the totem pole. These types of shows, I'm convinced for Noah, are a much more significant, have a, are, are much more significant for them than they are for, for New Japan, who already are the market leader. No are more along the lines of, well, we will be able to generate more eyeballs. This is a this is a good investment for us to get involved in this show here. Because we we will more than likely attract more people. And this tension thing, this little war they have going. No one really comes off as the underdog here. It re they really do come off as, you know, we want to be noticed. We want to be recognized. And this all comes to a head later. Uh, the first uh, match of the main card had Hiroshi Tanahashi, Satoshi Kojima, Takashi Segura, and Toriyano. So a mix of New Japan and Noah guys here. Defeating the Bullet Club team of El Fantasmo, Gedo, Kenta, alongside No Michi Marifuji. Marifuji and Kenta, of course, tag team partners for a long, long time. Uh, so, you know, Kenta even offers Marifuji a Bullet Club t-shirt to begin with. And 
Marafuji just chucks it. And they, they try to, the gag for the match here is that they try to too sweet Marafuji. And Marafuji is like, I don't want to do this thing. And he's pretending that he can't do a, a, a too sweet. You know, he's like, well, how do you do it? Anyway, Kojima, machine gun chops Gato during the match. You got to appreciate being able to do that to the booker. Marafuji doesn't want to play El Fantasmo's games, who's being, you know, his goofy self here. Uh, and uh, Segura superplexes Phantasmo. He no sells the purple nurple. Hiroshi Tanahashi and Kenta uh, go after each other. A lot of animosity. They're playing up their upcoming match during this tour here. Um, Toriyano uh, Manhattan drops. Uh, Marafuji removes a turnbuckle pad. The Bullet Club stomp Yano as he protects his turnbuckle pad. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Kenta and Marafuji put him down. They try to get, they being the Bullet Club guys, they try to get uh, Marafuji to too sweet. Uh, but Yano distracts, low blows Ghetto, rolls him up for a win. Just a simple match, nonsense, some goofiness. Let's just get it out of the way. It, you know, fine. It was fine for what it was. You know, little little crowd pleasing opener. Then we had El Desperado defeating Yohei. So we had some junior heavyweight action going on here. No titles, no bragging. It's just, and doesn't even count to the larger. No one's in Congo or LIJ here. It's, we're having a match between two really dynamic uh, uh, junior heavyweights. And I, I enjoyed this. I thought that was really, this was really solid. Diving sent on by El Desperado. Locks in an Indian death lock. Hold on Yohei. Yohei's knee is the story here in the match where Despe tries to work it. But nonetheless, uh, Yohei hits a, a Rana, Topikon Hilo, then missile drop kick, a twist of fate. And commentary put over the fact that Yohei, you know, is very influenced by the, uh, you know, uh, he's called the Hardys, part of his uh, influences. And, uh, you know, you look at his hair and the way he, he performs, how he holds himself, and you're like, yeah. Okay, I can see it. I can see a lot of Jeff Hardy actually in it. It's a chop block. Uh, Del Desperado, excuse me, lands a chop block. And a numero dos uh, gets locked in as well. Uh, Yohei reverses it into a near fall. Desperado lands a, per, a pinche loco. Uh, Dragon screw a full, uh, or at least tries to do a pinche loco. Gets reversed into a near fall attempt again. But then lands a dragon screw on the bad knee. Fully applies a pinche loco. Arn's trapped and everything. And just like, there's nothing he can do. A, a, a numero dos. Excuse me, not a pinche loco. A numero dos. Gets it all locked in. Can't, he can't, uh, there's nowhere Yohei can go. His, his arms are locked up. His, his legs are all in a bundle. He's done. He taps out. Good little match. Then we have the team of, uh, the Noah team of, Alejandro Amas, uh, Amakusa and Hun Junta Miyawaki defeating the uh, uh, the team of uh, Master Wato, Taguchi, and Tiger Mask. That was fine. A good little, uh, a, f a fine little six man. Nothing much to report on it. Ends with a German suplex with bridge uh, by Amakusa followed by a red arrow. That was fine. Amakusa is going to have a bigger role to play coming up later on. Then we get the match of the night. <laughs> Kato Kiyomiya, GHC champion, which is, of course, Noah's world championship, and Yoshiki Inamura taking on Kazuchika Okada, IWGP world heavyweight champion, and Togi Makabe. This went to a no contest. And this match starts off, and this, you know, everything was pretty palpable, right? As I said, with the with the tensions, everyone was playing it up. The New Japan guys and the New England guys don't hate, they, they hate each other, and they're like, they're shoving each other. They're not letting each other celebrate. They're doing, they're doing shit to each other. It's all building to this. This is what you realize now. The 2020 vision. You look back on this, and you're like, oh, this is what we were doing. Okada is, he's not giving... Kiyomiya, the time of day. Kiyomiya is the, the world champion. Like, technically, he's on his, you know, 
They're both world champions. But Okada is in the ring. He gets to the ring and he's not even looking at him. He's not even looking in his direction. He's, he's, stare, he's purposefully looking away from Kiyomiya the entire time. He's not giving him the time of day at all. And you can tell Kiyomiya, he is, his eyes are boring holes right into, uh, right into Okada's skull. But Okada's being a bit of an asshole here. Or at least, look, he's like, look, I am the world champion of the biggest promotion in this country. I don't know who you are, but he's really playing that game. It's like, who are you? Who are you, kid? Kimi is what, like 26, 27? Yeah, he's 26. Okada is a bit of his elder, but I mean, we're not talking about like 15 years older. It's like maybe not even 10, 10 years old, uh, maybe a, a decade, right? Okada is like 30, he's 35. Nine, 10 years. So it's not like, you know, we're not talking like Kaiji Muto coming in is like, who are you, you punk? But that's what Okada is doing, right? And Kiyomi is like, you know, he's literally doing, you know, it's like, look at me. Acknowledge me to a degree, you know. And uh, Makabe and Inamura start off and, then, you know, that's fine. But the story here, it, like the, honestly, the match doesn't matter in and about itself. Because the story here is that, is at some point, early in the match nonetheless, Okada has Inamura in a chin lock. He's drilling back and his back is turned to the, hit the opposing corner. He's, yank, he's cranking the neck back. Kiyomiya barges in and starts, he tries to break up the pin, uh, the, the, the lock with kicks to Okada's back. Okada's no selling them. Okada's like, he shrugs them off. He's just like, and he sort of turns his head, but not really, you know, he's like, talk. And Kiyomiya just gives him a couple. And then at some point, Okada starts to turn. And, no, and, and Kiyomiya just lands a boot right on the mush. Laces first. The, the most savage kick to the face I have seen in a long time. He, Okada just fucking eats it. There is no other way to put it. And, you, and I pop out of my seat. And you can, Kristen can confirm this. I jump right out of my seat. I'm like, what the hell just happened? He just, sh he just shoot it on him. Okada releases the hold and he goes after Kiyomiya and they start stiffing each other. And they, they, they tumble to the floor and Okada's just wailing on him. But not like in a, in a fun, oh, oh, this is script. Like this feels raw, it feels real. And they're just laying into each other. He's busted open. Okada is. You know, he got hit in the middle of the forehead. And he's busted open. He's bleeding. And they're just laying into each other. Okada's on the floor. Kiyomiya gets him on the floor at some point And he just runs by and tries to kick him in the head. Kiyomiya launches into them. They're brawling. They're fighting all over. Throwing each other into the into the gate. They mount each other. They're punching on each other. Makabe tries to break them up, but Kiyomiya drops drop kicks both uh, 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 both uh, 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 Makabe and Okada. The referee is trying to get control of the of the match, but no one. The champions are just going after each other. We get German suplexes. They're dumping. The other guy on, on, on commentary table, they're just, they're trying to kill each other at this point. The ref throws the fight eventually. It's a state of chaos. Okada is pissed off. Kiyomiya grabs the microphone and he says, you know, it's about time you notice me, you know, and I want, you know, we're going to have a fight, you know, and, and Okada's like, mm. goes backstage and he's pissed. And I am up out of my seat and I'm saying, this is so good. This is so good. The, and I, I promise you, this is probably the best work shoot 
I've seen how uh, Warren. How do you know it's a work shoot? Look, you're not dropping people with suplexes if you're shooting on them. You're not grabbing someone like this and dumping them on a table without the person getting out. Like there are certain things that happened in this sequence that were clearly that would clearly point to a work, but for a good amount of time I was like I didn't know until I think the moment that I was like oh, okay this this is planned at the very least it's planned when Okada grabs Kiyomiya to dump him on commentary table on the English commentary table and I'm like okay because there's no way Kiyomiya is going li to let him lift him up like that to do it not not so cleanly not in the way they pulled it up and then Kiyomiya suplexes he, he, he suplexes Okada, German suplex on the floor. I'm like, you're not suplexing another guy if you're shooting right now. I think this is the greatest work shoot I've ever seen. And I'm, and I'm thinking back at a recent history of work shoots. And I'm trying to think... You know, the outsiders showing up on, on, on Nitro. That ruled. Um, the, the pipe bomb. That's, a, that's a, a great one. You know, recently, it, it was MJF's departure from AEW last year. Was that a work shoot or what? Look, you know, we'll probably, we'll probably know, in a, you know in a couple of decades when people start talking. But this was so good. And it sold me a ticket. I was watching this. And I was like, all right, whatever these guys do next, I'm buying. This sold me a ticket. Whatever show they're going to put on, we're gonna, they're going to put this on, has me. It's, it's going to be a pay-per-view. It's going to cost 40 bucks. That's fine. 50 bucks. That's fine. I'm watching this match. Anyone who watched this is excited for Okada versus Kiyomiya. That's how you make, this is, work shoots are tricky business and a lot of people like to do them, but you always have to ask yourself one question when it comes to a work shoot. How does it make you money? How does it make you money? Like in the case of The Outsiders, it created the whole NWO angle, to, it, it, it converted WCW into its biggest years, its most profitable years, selling merch out the asshole when they when they 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 could barely manage proper merch sales at live venues. The pipe bomb created some of the most interesting stuff in WWE, and uh, you know some of the most compelling angles to move forward. Probably sold a lot of tickets based on that. This is excellent. And they're still doing the, they're still working. They're still doing the work. Because you have Okada doing backstage commentary and saying, you know what? Look, oh, New Japan, they, they put out a graphic saying that I was going to fight Kiyomiya at a show. I didn't agree to it. I'm not going to do it. I didn't agree to it. I'm, I am, and this is what's, he said, I am the world champion of New Japan why would I fight this guy? I, do, I have eyes for one belt and it's this one here. I don't care what this, what this Bean Sprouts belt is. And it is fantastic. Meanwhile, Kiyomiya is fuming. And he said, this Okada guy didn't want to give me the light of day. The time of day. He didn't, wouldn't even look at me. Now he has to notice me. Now he knows who I am. He pretended I, he didn't know who I am. Now he fucking knows who I am. This is not great. How is this not absolutely 100% the best work shoot I have seen? I'm trying to rem I'm trying to think of one better because this came out of nowhere in an environment where it made sense for the New Japan guys and the Noah guys to shoot on each other, where you're not sure and everything is convincing and everyone played their parts. Perfectly, right down to the young lions who were around the ring. Everyone played their parts to a T. Commentary was exceptional. 
I bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. And if someone were to come to me today and say, Warren, for real, for real, it's a shoot and I have proof because this, 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 I'd be like, this is even, okay, fantastic. And and if it is a shoot, you know, I'd be like, fantastic. So you're taking this really obtuse and terrible situation and you're going to make a buck out of it. I can appreciate that. Because yeah, because the next day, it's announced that Okada and Kiyomi are going to have their match at the Kaijimuto, his final, final, final retirement match show uh, in December, uh, in February, December, in February, in, in a month, a couple of days after my birthday. Happy birthday, Warren. You're getting the, you're getting what's going to be the most anticipated match of the year in one of the hottest angles to kick off 2023. This is so good. Pro wrestling doesn't have to be complicated. And I know, I know a lot of people like to make it complicated, but it's not, it shouldn't be. It doesn't have to be. Not one, it doesn't have to be that complicated to be great. You don't need months of storytelling or people telling you that it's whatever they're doing is storytelling to get this done. Instant, instant reaction. Everyone's excited. No one could believe what was going on. This ruled. This ruled. Don't let anyone tell you the opposite. This fucking ruled. And the card, well, the, well I'll preview the card in a little bit. Just run it down. But the card for the, for the, the Mudo show is fantastic. But this outshines anything else. It even outshines old Kaiji's going away present. This match is remarkable. This was a an absolute hit. A swing and a home run. Perfect. I love pro wrestling. So then what does this do? Then what does this do? It sets us up for the rest of the show, which is the best of five series between LIJ and Congo. And now we're on this, 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 uh, this energy where the Nuge guys and the Noah guys just hate each other. We can feel it. Our champions burst apart at the seams here. The de facto leaders of the locker room were like, no, let's fucking go. So the first one we had was Tadasuke, who defeated Bushi. No big surprise here. I called this. You know what? I I called every win here except for the final. Except for the last one. But I called everyone here. Uh, fine little match. I I found Tadasuke worked really hard here. No big surprise. Bushi took the took the loss here. Um, uh, yeah, some good action. Strong little good little match. Bushi uh, Bushi uses the mists on Tadasuke, but he rolls him up. But Tadasuke reverses it into a crucifix for the win. So they were putting over the fact that. Tadasuke, despite the fact that he had been misted, uses his wrestler instincts to get the one over Bushi. Bushi just can't cut can't, can't kind of a break. Can't get a break. But I called this Bushi losing. It's, you know, death, taxes, Bushi eats the pin. So it's one nothing Congo as we move into Hiromu Takahashi defeating Hajime Ohara. I like this match quite a bit. Um... Ohara lands a huge backbreaker early on and stretches Hiromu. He's working Hiromu's back throughout this match here. Running basement drop kick. Uh, Hiromu runs off the apron for some sort of dive, but Ohara, what does Ohara do? He just steps aside. He does a nope. Pump handle backbreaker by Ohara again, again, working the arm. Uh, not the arm, the, the back. Excuse me. Hiromu Takahashi then lands a, a, a DVD into the turnbuckle. Tries to go for the time bomb, but he can't do it because his back hurts. Can't lift him. But he does hit a pop-up power bomb and a falcon arrow. They strike at each other. They're charging up. 
O'Hara uh, locks in a muy bien, which is not unlike a numero dos. Sort of a stretch plum, but uh, Takahashi struggles out. Hiromu lands a lariat, a victory royale. O'Hara kicks out, but the time bomb too gets the win for Hiromu. Good little match. I enjoyed this. This was strong. This was strong. And uh, commentary was putting over the fact that O'Hara, you know, he's the newest member of Congo and he has a lot to prove here. And, you know, Takahashi's on a whole other level. But O'Hara did most of the heavy lifting here. He put on a great performance, I thought. And I'm seeing a bit of a pattern with Hiromu matches recently where he he takes a lot of punishment and then musters out a last minute win and is that what I want out of my Hiromu Takahashi matches? Can't say for sure. Maybe it's a pattern that, you know, maybe it's we're just coasting on something here. I kind of miss big match Hiromu. But you know, he, um, Hiromu Takahashi, right? Uh, earlier this week, well, he, when I say he, uh, it was announced that, well, he, you know, to, to a degree, he, he is getting, look, I'm, I'm trying to do a setup here and I'm completely failing. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, what we have here is, uh, Hiromu Takahashi is, uh, going to be producing an interpromotional all star junior heavyweight festival. It's going to be a pay per view for New Japan World. It's going to be on March 1st. Let me read the article off of uh, Figure Four uh, Wrestling Observer. An interpromotional junior heavyweight event is set to air on New Japan World pay per view. And New Japan announced today that Hiromu Takahashi will produce All Star Junior Festival on Wednesday, March the 1st at Kirken Hall in Tokyo. According to its announcements, tickets for the show are already on sale, plus the event will air for a global audience on New Japan World pay-per-view. So uh, a, a, this will include a, so no specific matches or stars have been announced for the show, but a ton of promotions are involved, mostly Japanese promotions, uh, All Japan, Big Japan, DDT, Dragon Gate, Gleet, Ganbare, Just Tap Out, Michinoku Pro, New Japan, of course, Osaka Pro, Pancrase, Freedoms, Noah, Zero One, just to name a few, and CMLL are also going to be included in this. And this is a dream that Hiromu's had for years at this point. He's been talking about this for a while, how he'd love to put, he wanted to put on like a, a show just celebrating juniors. And now he's got it, and that's going to be on March 1st. Puro, Puro is back. Japanese wrestling is back, baby. It, it, is, it is in such a good spot. They're making sure that they want people to be, they want wrestling in Japan to be in a good spot, and I'm excited for it. And a lot of people said, well, oh, where's AEW? Um, look, maybe Tony, look, these are what was been announced. Maybe Tony will send someone, but... March 1st, this is the week of revolution. So, you know, I don't think he'll be sending Darby, for instance. You know, I'd, if he sends any any juniors, my Kip, maybe, you know. But he's not He's not going to send, you know. For some reason, of course, this always turns into, well, the AEW sucks that they're not involved. Maybe, first of all, maybe they weren't invited. And maybe Tony Khan was like, look, I have a show to put on. I appreciate, you know as it stands right now, I just want to make sure my show is the best possible because my priority is my show, right? He could send talent over. Of course he could. But, you know, like I said, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think he's going to send Darby. I don't think he's going to send, well, he's not going to send Danielson. He needs Danielson for the main event. You know, it, not gonna send Adam Cole like he's you know you know what I mean like he's he'll say you know he might send uh you know the, the Dante Dante Martin send Dante Martin what is Dante gonna be doing at Revolution I don't know I'm just throwing that out there maybe he'll hang on to Dante Martin I don't know we'll see but this is fantastic news 
I am so excited for this. I am so excited for Japanese wrestling again. It feels so good to be excited about Japanese wrestling again. Anyway, so after the match, well, that brought us up to uh, 1-1 on the uh, best of five series, which led us into uh, Manabu Soya t- defeating Sanada, former tag team partners. This was this was all right, solid work, but this was you know, this is one of those Sanada matches that just doesn't have the spark, doesn't have the energy. It was fine. I'll just skip through the 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 the, the running notes here. There was a weird spot at some point where. Sanada does two moonsaults. He lands the first one, goes for the a second one. Uh, Soya li- lifts his legs, uh, his knees, I should say. And like Sanada sort of slides off the knees. So Sanada's knees sort of land on Soya's head. It was it was a bit of a weird bump. Everything was fine. Um, they continued the match. They ended the match. Tremendous lariat by uh soya and put sanada away again i called it two one in congo's favor but then we got to shingo takagi taking on katsuhiko nakajima match of the night i love this so much shingo is still one of the best shingo is one of the low-key Best wrestlers on the planet. And and here's the thing. Like, this is all a question of circumstance, right? This is all a question of what's going on around you at this time. But when you have guys like Will Ospreay and Kenny Omega out there, just tearing it up constantly. Let me put it to you this way. If Will Ospreay and Kenny Omega weren't around, Shingo Tagagi would probably be constantly ranked at the very top of the best professional wrestlers on the planet some feeling out between them both until finally Shingo gets a shoulder block knocks Nakajima down kitchen sink by Nakajima and a kick sends uh, Takagi to the floor Takagi fights back a sliding lariat superplex as well his midsection's the story here that's what uh, Nakajima's going for forearm strikes kicks chops Nakajima gets the advantage as uh, Shingo has nothing left. He's got no energy, but Shingo manages a belly-to-belly suplex. But Nakajima snaps a kick, which just drops Shingo. Boom. Nakajima tries the vertical spike. It's avoided by Shingo, who eats a fist right on the mush. Because Nakajima's thing is that he knocks people out. He's a shooter. So he lands a punch. Boom. Shingo crumbles. So Nakajima gets him in the vertical spike. It lands, but Shingo kicks out. Made in Japan by Shingo. Nakajima kicks out. Shingo lands a pumping bomber, a half and half suplex. And the last of the dragon for the win. Good showing here. Match of the night. I really loved this. I thought it was very compelling, powerful. Good old fighting spirit, good old strong style, good old smacking each other around. Two to two on the best of five. It all comes down to Tetsuya Naito and Keno. Naito comes out and he's got his it's it, big match gear on. And he stalls, which really gets under Keno's skin. Because he's taking his time and Keno's like, hurry the fuck up. And everyone in the arena is like... Everyone in the arena is, is, is sitting around going, "Well, Keno, this is what this is what he does. You're just gonna, you're just gonna have to wait. <laughs> you know, you're just gonna have to wait." Um, there's a little back and forth until Naito does the tranquilo pose, but Keno he just runs in and double stomps him as he's doing the pose to jeers from the crowd. Of course, you want you want you want Naito to land his, to get his shit in. Keno whips him into the barricades, double knee drop, works uh, Naito over to the point where Naito's shots have no stank to them. He's just like throwing limp noodles. But a drop kick to the knee gives Naito some time. He follows up with a hip toss and a drop kick, combination cabron, and the full leg Nelson. The, the Excuse me. Yeah, the full leg Nelson, right? Full Nelson with your legs. 
Strikes in the knee to the back of the neck uh, by Naito, of course, working the neck for Destino. More kicks by Keno, elbows by Naito, dragon suplex by Keno. Swinging DDT by Naito. And they're in this mode where they're just doing attrition strikes on each other. They're just exhausted. They just want to beat the shit out of each other. Rolling leg pick by Keno, which rolls into an ankle lock, which is really cool. Keno follows with a huge kick to the leg and another kick to the back. BFS lands by Keno. Naito kicks out. Ring of Fire is avoided by Naito as well. Spine buster by Naito though. Lands, elbows. We're at the 25 minute mark. 30 minute time limit. We're going down the going down the, the wire here. Oh, this actually might be a draw. But no! Naito pulls out of Valencia out of nowhere, follows up with Destino, gets the win. LIJ win, three to two in the best of five series. Not what I had predicted. Not what I had predicted. I had called I had called uh Kendo getting the win. Why not give the win to to the Congo guys? Give it to, to, to Keno and uh, let's just go. Let's just go right ahead. And uh, Naito here, because uh, like I said, you know, my reasoning was like Naito has nothing. Not, not, Naito has nothing. He's got no big stories, nothing planned for him. There's nothing, there's no path for Naito right now. So he could take a loss. It's not as if he's been involved in anything big. He could take a loss. Of course, we didn't know that he was going to be booked in the main event of the uh, of the, uh, the the Kaiji Muto's retirement match. We didn't know that at that point. Had I known that, I probably would have said something different. And at the same time, you know, you're like, well, New Japan is the biggest in the land. They've got the they've got the higher ground here. You know, they they're in a position of power over Noah. They have. A bigger audience, they have a bigger reach, a better TV deal, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Bigger gates, bigger arenas. They call the shots. They can say, uh, yeah, your guy losing to our guy, no, that's not going to work for me, brother. <laughs> I'm a little, yeah, but nonetheless, you know, I think... It, it wouldn't have harmed anyone. It would have made things a little interesting. But clearly, we're continuing this Lij, um, this Lij uh, uh, Congo feud, which I sincerely hope does not stop here. I hope it's not something that just like ends right here. And I hope it doesn't take another year before we we do more stuff together. And it doesn't seem that way with the way. Things are getting set up in Japan right now. I thought this was a good show. I thought this was fun. I think it was a much better crossover show than the one they did last year. There's there's so much to be said about singles matches in these types of shows as opposed to just multi-person matches all the time, which was the case last year. If you put in your multi-man matches and everyone has a good time, but man, this was special. This was fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed it tremendously, uh, and, and I'm still. I I still have uh, Okada Kimia in the brain. I that just won't go away. Let's wrap this up here. Just one more thing before we do head on to head on on down that dusty trail. Thank you everyone for still being here. If you're watching live, um, I watched most of the Kaiji Muto retirement show before today's uh, broadcast. I tried to cram in as much as I could. I, I got the main event down. That was the most important thing um, before I got in here. But I wasn't able to to get the whole show. I've heard that uh, that there's some great stuff, especially from uh, the women's match that they had on it. I thought it, uh, apparently it's a lot of fun. But, uh, but the main event here, because this was... <laughs> One of Kaiji Muto's retirement shows. I think this was his Noah. I'm so confused now. I think this was his Noah retirement show for Ka uh, any the Great Muta's retirement. Like I don't even know anymore. He's got like he's had like four of them. So I I, I you know his final New Japan match, his final Noah match, his final I don't know. But it's one of them. 
It's the it's the second to last one. I know that much. Was it where he teams with as the great Muda, of course, as he teams with Sting and Darby Allen versus Akira, longtime nemesis Hakushi, and Naomichi Marafuji. So Muta and Hakushi here take their time. That's the story here. Uh, because they are longtime rivals, so they're milking this one. They're taking them time trying to outsmart each other. But eventually Sting does tag in with Marafuji. Marafuji starts to chop him and Sting is just, he's completely no-selling. Just like absolutely no-selling the chops. It's Alan and Akira that get things going here. Uh, as expected, they were the ones who did most of the heavy lifting here. Except that one spot, and I'm sure you've if you've hang, hung around the internet over the past couple of days, I'm sure you've seen the spot where Sting launches Hakushi off the apron over the get over the, the the guardrail into commentary hell of a bump there that hakushi took and he's no spring chicken either great moon stabs hakushi in the head with a stake uh, a, a a funeral stake that is used in cemeteries processions in in, in japan it's made out of wood stabs him right in the in the fucking forehead hakushi's bleeding do we get a we, we get we get we get color in this match? Muda hits the flash elbow and locks in a crossface. Um Nakushi Dragon screws Darby Allen. Code red by Darby Allen on Marafuji and a suicide dive. Darby Allen sits Marafuji down on a chair and lands a missile drop kick off the top to the floor onto Marafuji sitting on the chair. Good stuff. Marafuji gets double teamed. Scorpion Deathlock by Sting on Akira. Dragon Screw by uh, by the Great Muda once again. Akira blocks a Shining Wizard. Lands a splash. Flying shoulder uh, shoulder block by uh, by Hakushi and a diving headbutt as well. While the ref, while the ref is d distracted, Darby Allen cracks his skateboard across Hakushi's forehead. Hakushi took a he took a lot of bumps here in this match. Like he he took a lot of uh, a lot of punishment throughout this fight. Hakushi eventually he starts drinking his own blood and then does his his rope walk gimmick, but he slips off at the end, which was a shame. But what are you going to do? He gets misted by the Great Muda, eats a shining wizard. Darby Allen lands a coffin drop and another shining wizard for the win. I thought the main event was fine. You know, you, you got your you got your emotion, your 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 uh, your I guess your big time event with Hakushi and this match. You even had the great Kabuki hanging around there. Uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of pageantry to that to the entrances to. Uh, to everyone coming in, they even did a callback to Sting's surfer look. But yeah, everyone came out. Everyone felt special coming out during this uh, during this match. You know, that's one thing that Noah does. I, I I find does really well. I know a lot of people have been talking about it, but the production is pretty much second to none, and the entrances here all look really special. I thought it was a good little way uh, to wrap up the show. It was a good main event. It was a good, uh, good little match. Again, like nothing that'll blow your mind, anything or anything. Like that, but, but still. So, what this is going to lead us into the last of the Kaijimuto retirement shows. The last one at Feb on February twenty first at the Tokyo Dome, the big one. So we learned just what was it yesterday or Sunday? The Kaijimuto is going to be headlining, of course, against Tetsuya Naito in a one on one match. I'm like oh interesting and then as the card progresses you realize there's a whole bunch of wrestling promotions that are being that are a part of this card noah new japan all japan ddt tokyo joshi pro we've got some women on this card so that's really exciting and some of it, it's you know, not everything is interpromotional. Some of it is, some of it, is, some of it is not. But 
See, I look at this card. Well, I, let's run through just a few matches because there's a lot of matches here. But of course, the ones that 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 captivate my attention. First of all, the Tokyo Joshi Pro match. It's a it's an eight woman tag match. Miyu Yamashita, Yuka Sakazaki, Rika Tatsumi, and Shoko Nakajima. Nakajima, excuse me. Taking on Mizuki, Miyu Watanabe, Maki Ito, and Yuki Arai. That rules. It's short. It's the only women's match on uh, on the card. But there is a women's match. All Tokyo Joshi Pro. I think that rules. Invited here amidst the Noah guys, the DDT guys. Uh, all Japan. Like everyone is represented here. Why not them? We're going to have... Um, so that's really interesting, and we've got we've got all sorts of multi-person matches here. We've got uh, the Dragon Gate crew represented by Shun Skywalker, Kai, and Diamante taking on Marufuji, Doctor Wagner Jr., and Ninja Mac from Noah. That should be a blast. Now we're but as we get towards the top of the card here, we have Mazada and Rongai Nasawa. Rongai Nasawa's retirement match. He is. Calling it quits as well. Long time professional wrestler friend, close ally to Kaiji Muto. He's calling it quits as well. And that Noah team is going to be taking on Gedo, who is part of that circle, a pal, and Taiji Ishimori. So we've got the older guys, younger guys, they're going to be able to mix it up together. So New Japan versus Noah on this one. We're going to have Hiromu Takahashi taking on Amakusa. Uh, more New Japan Noah stuff. Amakusa had a, uh, a good little showing at the crossover show in that uh, multi-man match. And Hiromo's Hiromo, they should rule. And this is where we're getting Kazuchika Okada versus Kaito Kiyomiya. It's non-title. It's for bragging rights. It's for honor. It's for uh, it's for its ego. I am so stoked for this match. I'm by, I'm like, I was going to get this show regardless because it's like, look, Muto's last show, I have to watch it kind of thing. But I mean, this just, this is a, anyone, anyone who was like, ah, I'm not going to buy a Kaiji Muto's final match. I mean, I'm convinced that this is converting buys. Convinced that this is converting buys. This is the hottest angle in New Japan, in, 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 excuse me, in Japanese pro wrestling right now. So hot. And then Muto versus Naito in the main event. Naito getting the nod. I think that's pretty cool. We'll we'll probably take the time to preview this match, uh, this card, once we get closer to it. But I wanted to talk about it here. Wanted to get y'all excited because this this is what pro wrestling should be like. This is this is what professional wrestling should feel like, should look like. Uh, promotions coming together to put on a show for the benefit of the business, each and every own's little business, of course, but for pro wrestling in general. When I talk about how Vince McMahon didn't do good, harmed the wrestling business more than he did, uh, harmed the wrestling business more than he helped it, this is kind of what I mean. I think we have a, a current day example of how wrestling should be. You get, wrestling is better if it has a thriving scene. What Vince did is make sure that WWE, its own interests were served. He didn't care about the business in and about itself. He cared about WWE. But historically speaking, promotions have always had exchanges and worked with each other and had put on cross-promotional shows. The new Japan AEW show, Forbidden Door last year, wasn't a necessarily a big deal because it was two promotions putting on a big show. No. It was a big deal because New Japan, 50 years in the business, decides to ally itself with a company that has been around for three. 
and put on the biggest international crossover wrestling promotion show, promotion show, cross promotion show in North America in decades. That's why it was big news. Now, this makes sense to me because the pandemic has hit eight each and every one of these companies hard in Japan. From New Japan all the way to Dragon Gate to Noah, all Japan. They have all suffered because of the pandemic. Now we're getting live crowds back again. Live crowds that can make noise, full capacity arenas. All of these guys, all of these business people who work for these competing companies at some point realize like there is there it is beneficial for all of us to be working towards a common goal making sure that wrestling stays relevant for all of us as opposed to each of us trying to yeah each of us trying to 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 to, to uh, create something in our own little bubble and excluding everyone else this is what it this is what a re a healthy thriving wrestling environment looks like promotions doing uh, big crossover shows like this so that <clears throat> you will tune in to see your favorite promotion your favorite wrestler maybe it was on the card but then you'll get to discover a whole bunch of others as it stands right now i'm reinvigorated by noah from what i saw at the crossover show i might give it another chance because nah, the booking sort of bummed me out that they, you know, Noah got rid of a bunch of uh, problems in the uh, around the booking committee and so on and so forth. Like they, you know, they made some changes, so I'm ready to I'm ready to to start peeking over again. What else are we going to see here? I'm going to be excited to see the Tokyo Joshi Pro girls there. What are you talking about? And in an environment where Stardom is is the second biggest promotion in in, in the country. Well, TJPW, they they want their they want their share out of that. They want to be able to benefit off of it. This is healthy. This to me is normal. This is what a thriving wrestling scene should look like. But here, this looks in North America, since we've had two decades of one business running the show and only one way, everyone thinks there's only one way to do things. When in fact that that two decades of monopoly is, is 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 an anomaly. That's just weird. That's something that had been never seen before, and ultimately, yes, did hurt the wrestling business in North America. It didn't hurt WWE, but it hurt pro wrestling in North America. So clearly, all coming together, they want to. They, uh, all coming together for very down-to-earth business reasons they all want to make money they all want to survive they all need these opportunities to be able to play off of each other to create a thriving business choice for people watching choice for the talent to be able to go work at like the, there's so many advantages and look as a as a fan of japanese wrestling you look at this kind of like let's fucking go puro is back and and in a few Two weeks after, not even two weeks after that, a week after that, 10 days, Hiromu's putting on his show, which is another cross-promotional effort. Makes you wonder, what the fuck are we doing here? We're all entrenched in our little, in our little wrestling wars, and we're like, nah. hey, WWE drones, AEW freakazoids, like... You fucking weirdos. Get behind pro wrestling. Who cares about the brands? Get behind shit that excites you, that makes you happy. Never mind what the other team is doing. And actually get excited. Push for the teams to work together. To actually put something on. Are you, like, everyone, think about it. An AEW, WWE, cross-promotional show. Of course, it would like, never happen. But what if it did? You know what that... Not doing it is what we call leaving money on the table, is what it's called. 
Get a thriving business going. Get a, a thriving, dynamic, interesting wrestling environment in North America again. Stop being so protective for, for, for insane reasons. There's no reason to be protective of WWE or AEW. Or, there's no reason. Love wrestling. Get behind wrestling. For real though, Puro is back. Japanese wrestling is back. I know it's you know it's a meme to say, but I really feel like it's like it is. I haven't been this excited in a while. I have not been excited about this in a long, long time. Anyway. We're gonna wrap it up here. Weekly wrestling inspection. Diddly doo. said we're done we are done for this week's edition of the mr warren hayes show hope you enjoyed it thank you very much for coming to hang out and chit chat and hang around hang out in the chat if you were here live on youtube.com slash mr warren hayes if you ever if you could ever make it 7 p.m eastern is when we start we i fire up the stream we start recording at about 7 30 ish 7 30 eastern it's a good time uh and uh but and, and if you can make it that's great if you can't that's fine too Consider giving a like on this video if you haven't already or subscribing to the channel if you enjoyed what uh, what's going on here. And if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast application, don't forget a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or a five-star rating on Spotify. That'd be great. I, of course, will be back Thursday with the AEW Dynamite review, which is equally a good time. <laughs> and uh, other than that, look, if you can't make it there, don't fret. I will also be back next Tuesday for another Mr. Warren Hayes Show. But in the meantime, I hope you have a great rest of your week. Enjoy all the wrestling, and I'll see you next time.